hearing is called to order. Good morning. That's what I like. Is good morning. My name, <laughs> thank you for all coming this morning. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. Today we are conducting an oversight hearing on after-school programming, COMPASS, um, NYC, and SONIC. In addition to oversight, we will be hearing intro number 1100, sponsored by Council Member Benjamin Kalos, which would establish a universal after-school plan. And intro number 1113, sponsored by Council Member Mark Traeger, which would require reporting on after-school programs. I would first like to thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for his commitment to the youth of New York City. He really is a tireless advocate who demonstrates his commitment to youth in everything he says and does. I would also like to thank the young people of this city. You inspire me to be a better person every day. And I rest well knowing that you represent our future well. Finally, I'd like to thank the youth advocates, the providers, and all of those of you who are here to testify today, as well as acknowledge my colleagues, Council Member Lewis, who has joined us this morning. Um, and we will be joined by other council members, I'm sure. After school programs provide students the opportunity to participate in hands-on learning, explore new interests, and engage in physical activity outside of the school day, outside of the traditional school day. Students may even receive nutritious snacks and meals in after school programs, helping to supplement their diets and physical growth. Time and time again, research demonstrates that after school programs positively impact youth. They experience more gains in math and reading achievement than their peers do who do not participate in after school programs. Their school attendance records also improve while dropout rates decrease and they have better attitudes towards school with decreased disciplinary incidents and experience significant reductions in drug use and other problem behavior. The results are clear. I need to say that again. The results are clear and well documented. After school programming is vital and it works. That is why I am such a big supporter and a co-sponsor of Intro 1100, which seeks to make after school program slots available to all students who request them. We owe it to our young people to make sure that they can access all the benefits of after school programming and level the bar. In New York City, DYCD is the lead agency that supports New York City youth and their families through a wide range of services. Specifically, DYCD is responsible for after school programming through its flagship programs, Compass, NYC program, which stands for the Comprehensive After School System of New York City. Compass NYC is made up of more than 900 programs that provide youth enrolled in grades K through 12 with access to quality after school programming. Compass NYC is structured into four program models, which include Compass Elementary, which provides programming to children from kindergarten through fifth grade, Compass Explore, which targets elementary, middle, and high school age youth, Compass High for ninth and 10th grade students, and Sonic, otherwise known as Schools Out NYC, which is, um, which is a middle school model. Each of these models is important as our DYCD pilot SONIC program and in initiatives that help students who are homeless, justice involved, or who receive benefits through the Administration for Children's Services. As we have consistently fought for increased funding 
and additional slots for each of these program models, we want to understand what more we can do as a city to make such programs grow significantly and are fully utilized. Collecting usage and other data about programs could help in this regard. And that's why intro 1113 by Council Member Traeger is also very important and why I'm also a co-sponsor. This bill would require ongoing annual reporting on after-school program funding, utilization, student demographics, and other criteria by program and by school. I look forward to receiving feedback from DYCD and the advocates on these two bills. We also want to learn what issues exist for providers and advocates and how after-school programs can be improved. At this point, I would like to turn the mic, well, I would have turned the microphone over to my colleagues, um, Council Member Kalos and Traeger, who will be here um, before this uh, hearing concludes. Um, I just want to um, take the opportunity, before we swear in the witness panel, I would like to thank my staff, Issa Rogers, Christian Ravello, Christine Johnson, and Venori Ranawera. Venori, I'm going to get it right before it's, before it's too long. I'm sorry. Um, and committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, Michelle Peregrine, and Elizabeth Arts for all the work that they have done. And now we will have the council swear in the panel. Thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, and um, right on time. We, uh, we've been joined by Council Member Chin and by uh, Council Member Kalos, who will, we'll give him a minute to get in his seat, who will um, give us remarks about his bill. Good morning, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. You can reach me on social media, at Ben Kalos. I wanna start with a huge thank you to our Youth Services Chair, Debbie Rose, who has been fighting for summer youth, year in, year out, getting it restored every single time, uh, and also to just the partnership between Mayor Bill de Blasio and the council, and working together to get Universal Middle School, and the fact that the council, led by our speaker and Debbie Rose, was able to get 4,000 seats baselined for elementary, and as we look at this legislation for universal after school uh, that we authored together along with council member Mark Traeger who is the education chair. Uh, there's a lot at stake. It's far less common for children to have a stay at home parent than generations ago and far more common for parents to work late with New Yorkers working longer hours than practically anyone else. This is leaving a gap between school dismissal and when parents are home. In New York, there are 584,597 children in K through 12 that are left alone and unsupervised. With 1.15 million students waiting for an available program and only 632,076 children enrolled in after school according to the After School Alliance. After school keeps young people positively engaged during the hours of 2 to 6 p.m. when research shows that they are most vulnerable to justice involvement, according to Council for a Strong America. Universal after school will increase and equalize educational opportunities, keep kids out of the criminal justice system, and make life easier for parents whose jobs keep them at work until at least 5 p.m., if not longer. As a new parent myself, I rely on an extended day and enrichment activities to keep my daughter busy while my partner and I are working. Maslow's hierarchy of needs must be satisfied if we want every child to reach their full potential. This means addressing physiological needs with universal breakfast, lunch, snack, and supper, safety needs with Child Health Plus, and finally love, belonging, and esteem through universal after school. I want to wake up in a city where every child has love and self-esteem they need to grow up to their full potential. I'm so grateful for Youth Services Chair Debbie Rose. Uh, for co-authoring introduction 1100 and 1113. Uh, Education Chair Mark Traeger for co-authoring and being lead sponsor on introduction 1113. And uh, I look forward to having 
a positive discussion. As mentioned, the mayor did the universal middle schools, which finally achieved uh, the number of slots it needed, I believe, last year when it went from 135.7 million in funding to 180.5 million in funding and 77,747 slots. And uh, there are about 500,000 students in kindergarten through fifth grade enrolled in public schools with only 47,000 compass slots uh, available to some 9% according to a 2019 report. Uh, and if the cost of elementary school after school universal was estimated at a total of about 250 million uh, in last year's preliminary budget hearing, we're hoping that the cost pays for itself and that we can get this done. And when we look at high school, I think currently we're budgeted at about $4.5 million for the high school after school program for Compass High and Compass Explore and uh, that with single digit millions that that is something that we could expand. So I wanna thank uh, the bill drafter, Malcolm Buterhorn, committee counsel, Paul Senegal, policy analyst, Kevin Katowski, and finance analyst, Michelle Perrigan, who is a huge asset for the city council. And I wanna thank my chief of staff, Jesse Towson, legislative director, Wilfredo Lopez for their work. Thank you and I hope we can get this done as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalos. Um, and thank you for all the hard work that you've done moving this, uh, this legislation. Um, and now we'll have the panel sworn in. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to Council Members' questions? I do. I do. Please state your names for the record. Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner, Youth Services. And Daryl Ratchery, Associate Commissioner, Youth Services. And you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Did they get sworn in? Good morning. Yes, we just did. Perfect. Chair Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services, I'm Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services. I'm joined by Associate Commissioner Daryl Ratchery. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DYCD's Compass and Sonic Comprehensive After School Programs. The Compass of New York City system is comprised of more than 900 programs serving young people in grades K to 12. Through a network of providers, Compass offers high quality programs that offer a balance of enrichment, recreation, arts, academic and cultural activities to support and strengthen the overall development of youth. Compass aims to help young people explore interests and skills, to develop social emotional learning, and to cultivate leadership through service learning and civic engagement opportunities. Through a continuum of after school programs from Compass Elementary to Sonic for Middle School students to Compass High, DYCD helps support young people on a pathway to success. Programs are offered at no cost and are located in public and private schools, community centers, and parks and recreation facilities throughout the city, both to leverage the use of public spaces and to help youth find a place that best fits their need. With the Compass Middle School expansion, the city now has the capacity to provide a high quality after school seat to every middle New York City middle school age youth. In addition, in 2015, Compass launched a program to serve middle school youth in detention and homeless shelters. In collaboration with the Administration for Children's Services and Department of Homeless Services, DYCD funded providers to offer tailored programming at six locations that cultivate supportive relationships and encourage participation in enrichment activities. Fiscal year 19 was the fifth year since the historic expansion of after school programs under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio. Last year, more than 122,000 young people were served in Compass. Of these, more than 50,000 students were served in 315 elementary school programs, 67,600 middle school youth were served in 400, I'm sorry, in 520 Sonic programs. Compass elementary and middle school programs are offered five days a week after school on some school holidays. Programs aim to foster social and emotional competencies and physical well-being, provide opportunities for youth to explore interests and creativity, and build confidence and leadership skills and facilitate community engagement and engage parents and other caregivers. The middle school model Sonic is structured like clubs where youth have the opportunity to choose from a variety of activities, including STEM, literacy, leadership development, and healthy living. Compass High is designated to help high school ninth graders navigate their new surroundings and matriculate to the 10th grade. 
In addition to advocacy within the community, the Compass High model offers targeted academic, social, and emotional supports. Last year, approximately 1,500 youth participated in Compass High. Compass Explore allows providers flexibility to create programs with a specialized focus for different age groups. Compass Explore programs offer a variety of activities from preparation for legal careers to boat building. Last year, 2,595 per youth participated in 38 Explore programs. This year, we strengthened partnerships and connections that support youth and families. To further strengthen access to services, we launched Discover DYCD 2.0, which provides search capabilities for New Yorkers to locate DYCD-funded resources. It's being expanded across program areas to include a sign-up feature, which allows users to apply for services directly from the web or a smartphone. In September of 2019, we held Bring Your Dads to After School event, a spin-off of the annual Take Your uh, Child to School Day across five boroughs on the 17th. The goal of Bring Your Dads to After School is to increase the involvement of father figures in our after school and evening programs. Studies have shown that when men and father figures are involved in activities with young people, there's an improvement for children behaviorally, educationally, <coughs> physically, and emotionally. In celebration of the Lights On After School Initiative, we held the Highway to High School event. Participants from Sonic programs toured high schools, attended student panels, and information sessions on the enrollment process led by DYCD high school participants. Finally, I'd like to touch upon the legislation being heard today. Uh, in number 1100 by Councilmember Kalos requires DYCD to make an after school slot available to any student who requests one. And in number 1113 by Councilmember Traeger requires DYCD to publish an annual report detailing availability of after school services. As you heard today, we've made significant progress in accomplishing the intent of both bills, to expand services and to provide greater access to young people and parents on the availability of services in their community. This year marks the 15th year since the inception of the system. What started as a $46 million initiative has blossomed to nearly $340 million under the leadership of the mayor and the city council, serving over 120,000 youth last year. These efforts are complemented by our Beacon and Cornerstone programs, which have also experienced significant investment in the last six years. Working with providers, program staff, principals, parents, and young people, we're launching a Compass stakeholder engagement planning process to plan for the future and lay the groundwork for even stronger program model in the future, in future requests for proposals. We welcome continued partnership with the City Council in this process and in continuing to find ways to meet the needs of the city's youth and create op opportunities for them to grow and thrive. Thank you again for the invitation to testify today and we welcome your questions. Thank you, thank you for your statement. Um, in um, fiscal 2020, uh, the budget negotiations, the council and administration successfully increased Compass Elementary programming by baselining an additional 4,000 slots at the cost of $14.8 million. And we really, we really thank you for, for helping us uh, make that a reality. How many of those slots are currently enrolled? And um, do you know how many providers were awarded those slots? We um, were very excited to have that investment to be able to expand the elementary after school seats. Uh, we knew that some providers would be able to um, serve young people, had young people that they'd be excited to expand services. We, um, that was funded in the adopted budget um, and we worked very quickly to um, get the funding out the door. We surveyed our providers to see who would be, um, you know, had the capacity to quickly ramp up and make sure that more students were served. Uh, we were able to contract out um, this year uh, more than 3,700 of those seats. Um, those contract amendments uh, were initiated in um, the beginning of November and providers were ramping up um, through this month. So we look forward to sharing the um, final enrollment numbers with you as the providers um, fill those seats. Um, how many providers um, were provided or awarded those slots? Um, it, 
um, I'd like to get back to you on that number. More than 100 providers were allocated seats in that expansion. Um, were there any delays at the start of the academic year in expanding the program uh, by the 4,000 slots? Yes, obviously, right? Well, like I said, you know, we, we were funded at ADOPT, so we, you know, we immediately took steps to see who would have the capacity surveying all of the elementary providers to see who, um, you know, had interest, ability, capacity, staffing being a significant component of that. Um, the contracts were initiated as soon as we were able to confirm those, um, the, the acceptance of those contracts by providers for November 1st, and, um, and immediately they began enrolling young people. Um, could the providers handle a, a, another expansion, um, say to double the amount, or an additional 8,000 slots citywide? I, we always go to the source to find out what the capacity is of the providers, but I have no doubt. In the past, whenever we've been able to expand services, our providers have stepped up to make sure that all of the resources are put to be best use. I have no doubt, but I don't speak for them. We would, we would, again, engage our stakeholders to respond to that. Did you experience any disruptions um, due to the newly required background checks? Um, for early childhood um, child care providers um, that the state issued this year? I would say, um, thank you for that question. I would say that the, um, that the field and our community-based organizations did experience significant disruption. Those changes were announced in August and our after-school programs ramp up to begin in September. Um, they were pretty significant changes that needed um, immediate response. We worked closely with our partners at the Department of Health and in communication with the State Office of Children and Family Services. Mm -hmm. I do want to point out that the burden of those requirements rests on our funded providers. So they experienced um, the significant disruption. Their license um, with the with New York State OCFS is a direct relationship, mm -hmm. and our we've taken our role to provide as much communication, coordination, and support as possible, um, whether through trainings or just sharing information as we get it immediately. Um, my colleagues have arranged um, special information sessions, and we've been pleased to invite Department of Health to to participate in those. But that is an ongoing challenge, absolutely. Um, what do you think contributed to the delays um, were, um, what contributed to the delays and why weren't they able to get them, uh, uh, check the checks, you know, in an expeditious manner so that there were not delays? Well, the rules were, the new requirements were announced in August mm -hmm. and that is the period where staff are ramping up for after school. So we've seen a lot of variability in the impact because if you, if you, didn't, if you weren't hiring new staff, the impact was minimal because the requirements were for um, new staff to go through more extensive clearances um, than ever before. And on top of that, I think the most significant change for DYCD and our for providers was previously the school age child care regulations allowed a new staff to work in a program if they were supervised by a cleared staff person. And the new regulations don't allow that. So if you've hired somebody, <clears throat> they can't work with children in the program until those clearances come through. That was a very dramatic cha change for our providers that really impact mm -hmm. new staff. Was there a significant impact? Do you know how many providers were, you know, impacted by um, or affected by the new background check rule? We're still gathering information. Every SAC program is impacted by this new rule, 100% every SAC program, because even if you have staff, even if 100% of your staff is cleared, you're put immediately on a schedule to get those staff re-cleared. So there's no one who's not impacted. But what we have seen is that some providers, again, 
primarily depending on how much turnover you happen to have this year. Mm -hmm. Some of them have reported to us that they have had to hold back their full participation in the program because they're understaffed. They're required, of course, to meet staff ratio. Safety is paramount. We're advising them, don't you know, be serving more kids than you have the ability to safely serve on any given day. And we've made adjustments in our contract requirements to account for that. Um, but we also look, have looked at enrollment system-wide. We haven't seen a huge impact this year. I, I hold, withhold, um, you know, noting how significant that impact will be until we get to the end of the year. So it seems as if uh, most of the delays have been rectified at this time? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, yeah. it's, not, it's not really, I wouldn't call it a delay per se. I think this is an ongoing challenge that providers will have from now until the foreseeable future. Every time a new staff is hired, they will be required to do these background checks. So there's, there's you know, this will be something that we have to work together as a city to um, to find ways to make as seamless and efficient as possible. There's no indication that there's, you know, a way out of this right now. In May to, uh, 2018, uh, DYCD released a new RFP for Compass, which was rescinded. How have the negotiations with the providers been transpiring since then? Um, and will a concept paper be issued? If so, when? And if not, why? <laughs> yes, we are excited to launch a concept paper planning process. Um, as you know, we issued the RFP with all plans to go forward. We got a lot of pushback from providers, and we took um, some months to communicate with providers who were giving pushback, to talk to Mox, and, and we've engaged with you to some degree. Um, but what we established was that the best thing we could do for continuity of services for the youth and for the community-based organizations to allow them to, you know, feel confident in their the contracts was to extend contracts. Um, our plan is to extend them through June of 2022. So we, pro we, providers will continue to offer those services, and we are now launching a full-blown comprehensive stakeholder engagement process. Uh, the commissioner it really wants us to um, map out a plan. We want to engage with you. We know you have um, welcomed that engagement at any time we've had a hearing. We certainly want to work with council, young people, community-based organizations, which we mm -hmm. to culminate in a concept paper that will kind of set the, set the path for a Compass RFP going forward. So you said you extended it to till 2022? June of 2022. So our plan is to um, complete a stakeholder engagement process and initiate a concept paper um, before the end of this administration that would be the culmination of the input from the field. So would that, um, so that means now they're um, still going to be functioning at the at the um, previous rate, the 2012 rate? Um, per no, um, because the contracts that were um, initiated in 2011 have, um, I think there have been investments since then, um, including um, cost of living uh, increases, and I know there's, um, uh, they're in, in being impacted right now with the potential to increase indirect costs. So there have been investments since then to the to the contracts. Um, will it's, it be equivalent to um, the uh, thirty two hundred dollar per participant rate? It would, in most cases, be more than that it rate. Would be more. Yeah. Would it meet? Um, the cost of living, uh, the prevailing wage? Those, right. um, there were wage, I don't know the details of the budget increases without my finance people, I apologize, but I know that there was an opportunity for all of the contracted providers to submit their um, wage increase adjustment asks. Um, there was some, there was an, an open door for them to, to uh, 
tell DYCD and OMB about their additional costs and get their contracts amended upward. And just recently, we've initiated another process that would allow them to report to us their approved indirect. So they have an opportunity to enhance some of the non-direct expenses that we've heard from providers are critical to providing high quality service. Um, does DYCD feel that um, the rate per person, per participant, um, will be sufficient to run, you know, healthy, robust COMPASS programs? Well, I, I, I take some comfort in the fact that the providers had the opportunity to tell us. I mean, I think sometimes their costs varied, and we, when we saw that in their reporting to us on staff costs, and we'll see that, I think, in indirect, although I think we've yet to see the the full impact of that. So I think that I'm, I, I take comfort in the fact that they're being asked to um, communicate what their needs are in that way. And we will certainly include the cost of the service as a critical component of the stakeholder engagement process. By contrast, what does the private market garner um, for after school services? I don't know the answer to that question. I. Um, in the private, I don't know, you know, what individual private programs are charging as their fees. Um, are, are you doing any sort of market analysis to, to find out if um, the rates are comparable? Um, and if so, what is um, a, a rate that makes uh, programming, you know, uh, the programming vibrant, robust, and, and able to uh, accommodate the needs of the young people? We haven't undertaken an analysis into privately funded after school rates, but we have looked closely at um, the costs of providing the Compass service. And um, again, I think we've, we've provided a few opportunities to for, for our providers to get enhancements to those contract amounts, and we'll continue to communicate with them about what true costs of providing a program are. Um, and, you know, we were, we were, we wanted, the, the council wanted to be a part of those discussions. Um, do you have a time frame that um, you're going to bring us into the discussions about Compass and the new RFP and the rates? I think following up this hearing, we should, um, we can reach out offline and we should set something up and put a date on the calendar to, um, to share our stakeholder engagement plan with you. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say, I, I did notice that you said that you're extending it out to 2022. We won't be here. It'll be a different administration. How is it that um, this administration feels that it it's okay to push that off into the outer years um, without resolving it before before this administration is out of office? Well, I, I want to say that DYCD issued an RFP, and the rates in that RFP were significantly higher than the rates that were in the previous RFP for those contracts. And it was providers who shared in that process. It's feedback to the RFP that they wanted us to stop and do a more robust and comprehensive um, process. So. We and were why would that be a negative? Wouldn't that indicate that um, what you were proposing wasn't adequate to do the serv to provide the services that we're we're proposing to provide? It did indicate to the city that we should continue the contracts that we have currently and figure and figure out the, the pathway moving forward. Yes, we responded to that by saying, okay. Let's let's um, let's extend these contracts, do our a comprehensive um, assessment process, and, mm -hmm. and take it from there. And so, are you saying to me that the comprehensive process, this assessment, is going to take until 2022? 
No, I don't think, no, it won't take that long, but we want to, our primary concern is continuity of services for the young people. So the contracts will be continued, but this, that process, even the issuance of a contact, contract concept paper would have to happen way, you know, way before that in order to you know, reflect communication and allow time for feedback. So um, do you think, so are you saying we'll see an RFP and when? We are committing to a concept paper. Our current plan um, is for um, early 2021. That's our goal. Okay. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues ask some questions, and I have many more. Hmm? Uh, yes, Council Member Kalos. Before I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been uh, we've been joined by Council Member Traeger, who may want to make a statement after um, Council Members questioning, and Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. When I was in school, my favorite part of the school day was after school. Uh, in particular, during after school, everyone got to play basketball, and teams were equally split without anyone getting picked last or left out on the bench. Suffice to say, I was not good at sports, and I love the after-school basketball program. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Susan Haskell and Associate Commissioner Dal Rautre, what were your favorite after-school activities as children? <laughs> I have conceded in some after-school um, talks that I spent an in inappropriate amount of time watching General Hospital. But I also um, participated in the school band um, very much. I played the flute, and I loved being part of that musical community. Thank you. Oh, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. <laughs> so I guess my most memorable after-school experience was actually as a teenager. Um, I was 14. Two years prior, my mother had just passed away from breast cancer. Um, I was, didn't know my father. I was living with my my oldest sibling, my sister. Um, Anne and I lived in the South Bronx. So that path of what was happening at the time in 89, 90, um, could have taken me down the wrong path. But after school youth development kicked in. And before you knew it, I was the president of, of a youth, youth um, council. Um, we were creating and mobilizing the community. We were doing events. We were, um, my first job was some youth employment program, working in the summer camp program. Um, so we were working with younger kids. We were leaders within that community. So that's always going to be um, the reason why I do this work and the reason why I stay within this job. Thank you for answering your calling. And uh, thank you to those who funded the programs that allowed you to find it. Uh, I, I, I had a different line, but I just want to follow the path you've kind of laid out about sharing your own personal experience about the community you grew up in and the, the alluding to the possibility of justice involvement. Do we, has DYCD ever done a study? Do we have any numbers on, uh, for every dollar we spend on after school here in the city, what the reduction in juvenile justice costs might be? There are, there are studies, um, there are studies about that and I don't have those figures at the top of my head. I was in a meeting just yesterday where some of those, um, figures were being shared. At DYCD, we also focus, um, in terms of our policy development and the programs, on what every young person needs for positive youth development. So you, in your question, like stated some of the joys and like how th the feeling of being successful in basketball may not have been your, <laughs> your thing, but I think when we're designing programs, we're thinking about how much it means to a young person to develop a positive peer connection to um, explore their interests, to learn new things, to have a caring adult there. Um, and the, of, the importance of avoiding negative behavior is critical. Um, but we also focus on, on the importance of what every young person needs to be successful, the components of positive youth development. Uh, th there, there is a silver lining to this basketball story. Ever since I got elected to the city council and we do staff versus interns basketball, I am so great at basketball, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but just dipping into the numbers, so I, I believe there's some offset that we can figure out what an offset is, and I would like to work with you on that. But at the preliminary budget hearing of the Youth Services Committee in 2019, uh, again, led by our Youth Services Chair, uh, Debbie Rose, DYCD was asked how much it would cost to offer after school to every student who needed it at every school in the city. And I believe there was an estimate of about a quarter million dollars. And so there's already $150 million allocated, and I think our math says that that means there's, there's $100 million left to cover that universal elementary. That being said, there might be a difference of opinion. So do you have an updated estimate? It's been about a year, a little less. Uh, do you have an update for uh, how much it would cost for participation? Sorry, do you have an updated estimate for likely participa participation in elementary? and the cost for universal elementary? We don't have details on what that would cost. We do know that it would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars at the very least for elementary alone. Uh, we, the bill being discussed today talks about a seat for every young person who asked for it. Mm -hmm. And um, those estimates would be very different than, you know, for example, putting the minimum level of service at every school that doesn't have a current city funded program. So the variables are dramatic in terms of trying to make that estimation. When, um, I also wanna mention um, Chair Rose's conversation about the rates, um, because I think there, you know, we, we are planning for the future and, we, um, and what those um, costs are for providers. And I don't think, um, the 2011 rates uh, can apply anymore. So I think that's I, I also agree. something that's changing um, and that would change in terms of a, of a, of a cost estimate. Um, most importantly, I think in your comment is that that was, a, um, that was taking into consideration the expansion only, not existing services that are funded. Okay, that, that is helpful to have as clarification. I, I would also just note that in California, which has 900,000 children, and we're just talking about elementary, but California's entire program, I think, was initially funded at 330 million, so this would put us uh, a, a little bit, if not higher, and then also in California, they are now at, I think, 10 years later, after, this was the governor's top issue, Proposition 49, I think it is now funded at 550 million by the state of California, serving 934,000 children, and then they also get 157 uh, million in funding from the federal government. Uh, do you know how much we're currently getting in funding for the federal government to offset our costs? DYCD um, does not receive to the best of my knowledge, any federal funding for our Compass After School program. Okay, uh, to the extent we can get funding through the 21st century grants which cover the community learning and uh, what have you, I think there might be an opportunity for cost savings. And I guess uh, last and, and first round, I wanna make sure I give a chance to our, our co-author to this whole package, our education chair, Mark Traeger. So when I went to a New York City public high school, my favorite part of uh, school was after school clubs. Uh, and so that was self-organized by kids, uh, and I don't think we actually had teachers. We had like a couple of security guards who made sure we weren't in too much trouble, and we got in a lot of trouble. Uh, meanwhile, the public advocate and our youth services chair uh, have been strong proponents for universal youth jobs, something I also support. Uh, DYCD only provides about $4.6 million for after-school programs serving high school students. Uh, about 4,142, according to the Independent Budget Office. Do you have an idea of how many high school students would uh, take advantage of a universal after school and what that estimated cost might be? Well, I think high school, looking at it, high school is, again, many, many variables depending on what, you're, what you wanna talk about for a high school program. Are you talking about a club that operates once a week, something more comprehensive? Our DYCD's perspective looking at high school students was the most critical time for them in this was the summer. So although Compass um, has a much smaller investment in high school with, in comparison to um, middle school and elementary school, their out of school time period that is the most significant is the summer. And our summer youth employment program with support from council has grown dramatically. 
and that's that's where our the most significant investment for high school students happens. We also, I mean, we're here for oversight on Compass today, but we also operate roughly 200 community centers, um, Beacon and Cornerstone community centers, where high school students participate, and that is that's not reflected in the Compass program model here. So I, we do have um, additional services outside of Compass. And, and one piece I'll note, and then I'll pass it back, and I thank the chair for her indulgence, is uh, the legislation provides a, a mandate similar to when the mayor announced universal pre-K. Uh, we finally got universal pre-K on the Upper East Side for this school year. Uh, so it took us six years to grow from 154 seats to the 1,100 seats that met the need in the neighborhood. So part of the legislation would actually give to you the opportunity to set forward a plan, control your variables, and, and what have you. And so I know the chair asked about, could you continue to expand at a rate of 4,000 seats or 8,000 seats or what have you. So I think the goal would be to make the commitment and then um, the other piece of the bill, which is my favorite part, because I hate reporting bills, is once you hit universal after school, you stop having to do purports on how you're gonna get it done. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to uh, sort of circle back on uh, what Council Member Kalo said. Um, could you tell us um, what was the methodology you used to um, for Compass, for I mean for Sonic, um, and could you use the same methodology to establish Universal uh, Compass? I, um, let me think, back to 2014. Uh, just before I came back to DYCD, there was a very comprehensive, again, um, research white paper um, presented that um, with detail, you know, in-depth conversations with stakeholders, again, our community-based organizations about what are the right models, what are the right costs. I think the Department of Education, working closely with the Department of Youth and Community Development to you know, do the work that you've, that we've discussed, you know, about what is out there now and what is it that we're committed to providing. And um, I think that was a, an extremely, again, robust and comprehensive process um, with a commitment toward uh, universal middle school. And so would you not apply the same methodology now? And, you know, what would that look like? And how would you, how soon would you be able to get that done? Well, I think um, you, this, this conversation is probably better suited for the um, budget negotiations. <laughs> but DYCD, again, we stand ready. If, um, you know, if, if the city commits to an expansion of after school services, we, we can you know figure out a policy again to make sure that the most young people can participate within a high quality structure um, ensuring to every extent possible we're getting to the youth that need it most that would be our that would be our approach you know if an expansion were, were um, so you uh, already have all of the data and the metrics that it, it would require to I, have a conversation about the universality of, of Compass? I don't think we do have all that information. We certainly have good, valuable information based on our existing programs, but we would need to engage stakeholders. Um, we'd need to talk to community-based organizations. We'd want to do some assessments around need, in particular working with the Department of Education. And um, yeah, I think we would, we would need to do quite a bit more. Um, so wouldn't all of those conversations need to take place before we go to budget negotiations? so that we would, we would really have a clear picture of, of what, we're, um, what the needs are and, and what, um, what it would take to make this um, a reality. Because um, all of us that are, are here today and that are not here today and that have legislation, we're, we're not doing this as an exercise in futility. We actually want to see this become the reality. And so if you're saying we need to have those conversations before we can move it to a place where we can achieve universality, um, I, I think we need to do that and, and have some sort of 
timeline, some time, time frame so that we, we get there. I, DYCD has valuable information to contribute to the, to the conversation. I don't think we have all the answers, but we, we certainly have valuable information to any you know, discussion about after school expansion. So we, we will be looking um, to see that there will be conversations that um, DOE will be brought into, into these conversations, right? And the yes, service providers. As well as providers. our providers and yes. Mm -hmm. Um, is it, is it too presumptuous of me to, to say that maybe we should, um, come up with some kind of summit, some kind of, of conclave where this actually begins to happen? I'll just <laughs> say we have expanded after school and community centers in this administration, like the expansion is completely unprecedented. We, we have a more yes, robust- Yes, so, and, and I, I do, I have to agree, and I, I thank you for that. Yeah. But um, I, I'd like to see the same type of um, verve and, 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 and aggressiveness that pre-K and 3K, you know, was pursued. Uh, because we know it's a, we can do it. Um, this administration proved that it, it's doable. Um, and so I, I, I want to, I, I want this to be more than just a hearing where we're asking questions. I, I, I want to see that there are going to be some action steps taken, you know, toward our goal. Um, Council Member Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair Rose, for your uh, outstanding leadership on this issue. Year after year, you have been the, uh, the leader on this, and we really appreciate you, and to my colleagues and uh, Councilman Kalos as well for, for your bill. Um, so we're also hearing, as, as we've noted, um, uh, my bill intro 1113 uh, at today's hearing, uh, which will um, require reporting on after school programs. And more specifically, my bill will require DYCD in consultation with DOE to report on the existence of after school programs and the funding allocated to those programs. And make no mistake, these are bills and, this, and, and the intent here is to lay the groundwork for universal uh, after school for every child. But I am very mindful about the word universal uh, because as chair of the education committee, when we hear about UPK, I cannot call it universal when there are hundreds of kids that we know of that have not been seated because we don't have the accommodations to address their special needs. And so when I hear about even after school programs, it is painful when I hear from parents that say, well, if school is not fully accessible for my child during the school day, what are we doing even after school? The same problem exists as well. So of the children that we're serving in Compass or in Sonic, how many, uh, is there data on the number of kids that have been turned away or number of kids that we cannot serve because of their special needs? DYCD, for, thank you for your question. We recognize um, different needs of different young people and <coughs> As we you know, move forward with the expansion of the Sonic program for middle school students, taking some of those things into consideration, um, District 75, for example, implemented, not through DYCD contracts, but implemented their own component of the universal middle school programs um, so that young people could have an extended day uh, who were participating in D70, D75 programs. We also, um, again, I think it was um, mentioned earlier, we put programs in places where we knew young people would be to help make access better for them, whether that was offering services on homeless shelters or offering services in ACS detention programs. And, um, and in the past, some of our requests for proposals have allowed for um, providers to apply for a slightly increased price per participant if they are working with, um, and if they're working with youth with disabilities to, to allow for 
accommodations that might have additional costs to them. So I think we, we take into consideration when we're implementing our programs that um, to meet young people where they are and to address varying needs. Right, but respectfully, why do we keep hearing that parents and children are turned away? I mean, for example, is it accurate to say that one of the services and after school programs is homework, help, or tutoring? Is that, is that correct? Uh, in many of our programs, yes. Right, and what happens when a family comes forward and says that their child has dyslexia? How is that issue being addressed in the after school program? We, we, we have um, contracts with providers to help support programs to, um, to better meet um, young people with varying needs. So we offer support to our providers to help um, structure program activities in order to make sure that they're as inclusive as possible. We offer support specifically to providers and we have you know, great uptick in those um, resources when we offer them. Uh, we, I think you would be um, pleased to see the kind of service that are, um, and some of them have very specialized, some of our providers really have a, a, an expertise in this, um, in working with young people. I would welcome any situation where you learn of a young person who um, needs extra support to see um, so what we can do to make an I just want to give you an example, and actually I think I see some folks from the Coney Island YMC, the YMCA here. Let me give you a concrete example. Because of the lack of existence of after-school services for children with autism in my community, the Coney Island YMCA voluntarily opened its doors to allow for programming for children in my community to have these types of services, understanding that there are certain sensory needs and certain sensory issues. They did that on their own. And I applaud them and I thank them for doing that. But there is no comprehensive plan that, that I see from the city to actually serve all children. So we, Chair Rose, Councilmember Kalos, and I, we're serious when we say universal. Every child from every zip code deserves a seat and deserves a shot. And what I'm sensing and what I'm hearing from families in my district and across the city is that that is not the case. And so, we want to work with you to fight for the funding to make this truly universal. And also, DOE needs to aggressively move on its capital plan to make our schools more accessible, to make sure that these spaces are accommodating children during the course of the day and after school, and partnering with community-based organizations such as the Y and, and other partners to make sure that we are servicing kids to, to the best of our ability. I think we should all be on the same page here. But I'm just mindful that not every child is currently seated, and partly because of the government's own failure to address their needs. So I look forward to working with you and my colleagues uh, to secure resources, but also to also make sure that we have an accessible city that meets the needs of our, of our families. And so thank you, Chair, for your leadership, and I, I turn back my time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair um, Traeger. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene, and um, I just wanted to ask a question about Summer Sonic before um, I, I go back to my colleagues. Um, in fiscal year 2020, um, the budget included one year funding for 15 million to support the program for approximately 22,000 slots. And year after year, the committee and council has successfully negotiated for funding of this program. And I am really, I have to say, I'm really thankful. Um, you know, I know oftentimes we beat up on you, but sometimes, you know, it's good to say thank you and I'm thankful. Um, can this committee expect to see some Sonic funded in the preliminary budget, um, which is set to be released on Thursday? Um, and, uh, and how successful was last year's summer programming? Um, and did we meet the enrollment? Um, how many schools participated? And how many more schools can we take on this summer? That's a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. But yes. So, no, no, it's good. But the most important one was can we expect to see Summer Sonic funded in the preliminary budget? 
which is set to be released Thursday. That's the most important. I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that if and when funding does come for the summer, we've proven year after year that our providers will um, ramp up as quickly as possible. We were able to contract out more than 22,000 of those seats, and we enrolled nearly 22,000 young people um, in those in those um, summer programs. And uh, we're if if it is funded in the budget, we will again work um, quickly to get that funding out and make sure we maximize the number of young people who get to participate in those summer programs. I, um, I have to agree that when, um, when we do get the additions, um, our providers are wonderful and they, they meet the challenge, but um, they shouldn't be challenged um, to the point where they are notified so late in the process that it becomes, you know, um, uh, more challenging. Um, I would hope that DYCD is, you know, really working with the administration to get it funded in the preliminary budget so that they have adequate time, so that they don't have to be stressed, so that they don't have to, um, at the last minute, jump through hoops to meet, you know, to meet, uh, which is something that's supposed to be a gift, become something super stressful and something that um, becomes uh, problematic, difficult, you know, it puts a strain on, on their programming. So um, I'm sorry that you don't know if it is gonna be, you know, released Thursday, but I would hope that um, DYCD would be really trying to impress upon the administration how important that it is a part of the preliminary budget. Um, and so um, you said that you were able to meet the enrollment and um, do you know how many of the schools took, um, you know, had programming for Summer Sonic? I don't have the details on how many um, different mm -hmm. programs were funded, but we would be happy to get you that information. That's really important. I mean, you know, Council Member uh, Traeger and, and Kalos and I are, are trying to make this universal. It would really help if we knew, you know, just where these programs, you know, are and, and how many we need to fill the gaps. You meant the summer programs in your question. Sonic. Yeah. yeah. Summer Sonic. Mm -hmm. um, Council Member Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, Chair Rose. Um, I want to thank you for you and Council Member Kalos for holding this hearing. Uh, and I'd like to follow up on what Chair Rose and, and Council Member Traeger have raised. Um, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're painting a very rosy picture here. But the truth is government is failing our children. And it fails our children every time it has to count on the city council in the 11th hour identifying funding for Summer Sonic. You're saying that we're nearly filling all the 22,000 seats. That bar is so low, so low. I know this because I hear from constituents in my district who don't know whether or not their kids will have a chance to be in a summer program, and therefore uh, they, they assume they're not gonna be enrolled and make other plans, which means putting them in front of the TV all summer long, and frankly, Slots are filled so quickly that my families can't even get in. I mean, the definition of universal, we could say we have universal public school for our kids, K through 12, pre-K through 12. We don't have universal after school or universal summer school or universal things for them to do on Saturdays and Sundays. And the impact of that is twofold. 
one for the kids who um, really could use the help and be nurtured, they don't have equity. And then there are quite a few children who really need to be occupied and whose parents want them to be someplace that is constructive for them. When I talk to, you know, and, and again, this is one side. The one side is there are kids who could really benefit for whom there is no equity. They have no access to these programs. And that holds them back academically. But there are also kids who, um, you know, in my talking to, uh, you know, the head of the community centers, they know who these kids are who can't get into their programs because they don't have $2 in a sliding scale to pay every day. And so they miss out. I've got providers who want to provide after school programming and evening programming, weekend and summer programming. They want to do this. But government sets them up to fail by telling them at the last minute that they may or may not have a contract, by severely underfunding them, by paying them a year and a half later, how can you hire for that? Government sets them up to fail, and therefore we're failing our children. I think DYD, DYCD has a responsibility to understand demand for this program, to know where the absence, where the uh, holes are, where we're not funding programs. And what's frustrating is you're painting a very rosy picture <laughs> that special ed kids are being, their needs are being taken care of. They're not. You know, the nonprofits may or may not have the bandwidth to reach out to DYCD to get a specialist for curriculum for the kids with a variety of special needs kids who they're serving, serving right? So um, I mean this with all due respect, but you know, it would be very helpful to hear in your testimony, not the rosy picture, but where we could be doing better you know, on the Upper West Side, um, we're having some issues with youth um, uh, minor crimes after school, right? These kids are getting into mischief, serious mischief. And my constituents are coming to me and asking for more police. And I say to them, we don't need more police. What we need is after school programs. And the principals want to put them in after school programs. They know who these kids are. They want to provide a service for them. But there's nothing, because there's nothing free. It's not universal. Or the, whatever is free is totally jam-packed. There are no slots left. So I don't understand why. Um, I'm wondering what. Um, the mayor is doing, what you are doing, to address the prevention issue, right? And to make sure there's equity for kids who need after school for enrichment. Thank you for your passion for young people. We share that passion and um, you know, forgive me for, for being rosy about our programs, but we spend the majority of our day working on the task at hand, which is like implementing and supporting the, you know, hundreds of thousands of young people that we do work for. And we have the privilege of seeing that work all day long. And that's where that energy is coming from. Um, certainly we, we are open to, you know, if you talk about particular issues on the Upper West Side, we'd love to meet with you know, people in your community and see if we can identify seats for them. I think it I mean, might, 
it mm. may be that we do have places for them to go. And it's why we have invested significant resources in, like I mentioned, Discover DYCD 2.0. Um, I'm not convinced that you can't go online and find an available resource for it, but depending on, I don't know what age level you're talking about or, or what specific location, but I think one of the things we, we battle in our, um, in our outreach efforts is to, um, we, we're just, we continually want people to know about the programs that we do have, and we may be able to find an option for those young people. I, I, I see your point about is every single young person in New York City in a program? No. But we, um, we would like to work with you and see if there are options. Sometimes there's a foregone conclusion that there isn't a resource available, and we want to say, like, let's talk, because um, it, you know, it's our job, wherever there is availability, to make sure we can link up a young person with a service. I mean, with all due respect, sure, I'm happy to sit down with you, and I'll tell you the neighborhoods, and if you can find me a program, great. I, there are 50 other districts that are having the exact same problem. So it's not like I'm unique, number one. And number two, um, I, I'm pretty familiar with the after-school programs and the summer programs in my district, and I, I want to be clear, there are no slots available, none. There are, every year, there are lists of families on wait lists who do not get in. Okay. So, if you want me to pick up the phone and call the deputy commissioner every time you know, I have somebody on a wait list, I'm happy to do that, but um, I'm not sure that's comprehensive planning. I, uh, well, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying we have publicly available tools now to help um, people find resources. And, I, right, but and I think new, what I'm so saying is your hands are tied. And I, I wish you would admit that and, and join with us in fighting to lift up these nonprofits that are trying to do the best they can. I mean, in, you know, when we look at delays in contracts, DYCD has, uh, you know, is, is the largest, has the largest number of contracts and is the farthest behind on getting those contracts registered so, you know, these providers can be paid. It's just a reality. It's not that, you know, well, you have a lot to do. Well, yes, you have a lot to do. That's why you need the resources in order to get that done well. I mean, we are a big city by definition, so are you getting, if, if you're behind in getting these contracts registered, there's a reason. It's not because you're inept. It's because you, you're, you're being set up to fail. You don't have the resources you need to get it done. Are all of your ACOs trained on passport? You know, yeah. last time I checked, the answer was no. That, I mean, it's okay. It, it doesn't bother me. It's just, so get, let, what do we do to get them trained? You know, the nonprofits are trained. They're ready to go. Yeah. I, They're I, not getting paid. I, I'm, I'm not here to respond on behalf of the ACO, but I will say the expertise in DYCD's ACO unit is very strong. Again, it's We're not about training. expertise, yeah. it's about numbers. Yeah. Do you have enough staff to get it done? You're, you're woefully behind in getting those contracts registered, and it's to the detriment of all New Yorkers. The link is, is it may be circuitous, but it's very clear. I'd like to offer to look at that data with you again offline. I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have the ACO data, but I, I know how, I, you know, I'd like to, we'd like to explore that further. So, so just to last question, Council Member, to Council Member Rose's question, will there be funding for Summer Samic in the preliminary budget or not? Because if not, we are going to have a job on our hands uh, in budget negotiating team fighting again for it. And let me tell you, uh, for all New Yorkers, you have no fiercer advocate than Debbie Rose, who, who is laser focused on making sure our kids get the summer programming they need. And I would argue de minimis even in Sonic. Um, you know, these are kids who really need full day, on the weekends, uh, programming, 
So is the mayor putting, I mean, it's no, it's not like it's, uh, um, you know, this is real work. So I, I don't need to be surprised or not surprised. Is the mayor going to have it in his preliminary plan? It's an easy yes or no. I, I, without, I don't have my finance team here. I don't have the answer to that question. I will say Commissioner Chong has, in his testimony here, many times to council, made it clear that we support this service. And when it's funded, we, again, we, we believe it's a valuable service for young people in the summer. And we are aligned with you in our support for summer services for, for young people. And I think he's made it clear that this is a this is a program area that we support. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for you know going down that road, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, you know we're talking um, about issues in our city right now. Um, we're talking about an increase in hate crimes. We're talking about an uptick in, um, in miscellaneous uh, crime. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with young people who are misdirecting their energies and um, are not avail are, are not, don't have the resources available that they need. And our after school programming addresses social development. Um, it, it, it's an educational program. And for us to talk about, um, oh, we need to do something about the uptick in hate crimes. We need to do something about the uptick in, um, in uh, low-level uh, nonviolent crimes that's happening. Um, it's like talking out of both sides of our face if we're, we're not recognizing how important it is for us to fund fully these after school programs. And, you know, universal after school would address a lot of, of the issues that we're seeing now. And we're, we're taking a, a circuitous route, we're looking all over the place. And um, I think the answers are right in front of our face. And for us not to acknowledge it and to act as if um, that, you know, after school is some panacea that is only, you know, um, available for a few, you know, privileged young people, um, because that's what it turns out to be. It's a privilege right now to be able to participate in, in a free after-school program. Um, I, I think we're missing the mark, and it has to be a part of the conversation that DYCD has with um, the administration. Um, and it drives back to the point that we need to know what that funding is going to look like in the early stages, in the preliminary budget, so that we can really have programming that's going to meet the needs of our young people. We've been joined. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about a very important um, guest. We have with us um, Borough President Gail Brewer, who um, would like to testify. Yes. Oh, 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 wait, wait, uh, no. Oh, is that what you wanted to do? Oh, oh, okay. Um, um, uh, Borough President, um, Council Member Chen, we have some more. I'm sorry. Sorry, Gail, he just got away. I don't want to let him go. I have questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I really want to thank our chair for her leadership. I think Council Member Rose and I have been on the youth committee since we started in the city council, yeah. 10 years. And the first four years in the previous administration, every year was fighting the cutback. 
I remember all the rallies and all the demonstration just to save the program that we have. And in this administration, when it first started, we were very hopeful. And we do want to thank the mayor uh, for helping to expand, you know, after school program, middle school program, SYEP. But it always has been strong advocacy from the council, okay? From council member Rose, council member Eugene, who chaired the youth committee before, Constantly, we have to be on the case to fight. And what we asked DYCD was to work with us, right, to kind of jointly see what is the funding that's needed to get us there. It was the same thing for the summer youth program. And we made such great progress. And that's what we want to do for the after school program, for the elementary school kid, every single kid deserves a seat if they want one, right? Because some parents who are more well-to-do, they can send their kids to piano class or whatever. But there are kids, immigrant kids, low-income family kids, who need this after-school program. I was an after-school teacher back in the 70s, and the summer component was part of it. It was after school, and then it goes into the summer. That's why we don't understand why every year in this past six, no, five years, the first year the mayor put the money in. I think for the last few years, we had to fight to put the summer component back. And that, that is not right. Meanwhile, there are waiting lists for after school program. And I don't know if DYCD keep this, that, you know, the statistic and also the coordination with the Department of Education. Because when principal wants to do after school program, how do they do it? They don't get enough funding to do that. It's pitiful that there are kids because they need the program, the parents have to pay. And these are immigrant parents, low income parents, they are forced to pay thousands of dollars a year for the after school program and summer program because there's not enough free after school program and summer program in the school. That's a reality because some of the schools in my district, I have after school program, but you have to pay. It's run, for, run by nonprofit because the parents demand it. They need it, they gotta work. They need those programs. So what we're asking DYCD is work with us. Let's look ahead and work with the providers how do we get there? How can we increase it every year so that we can get to universal, that we can meet the needs of every kid? But we're not hearing that from you. I mean, even Commissioner Chong, every time when we have the budget hearing, right? Yes, you support it, but I want to hear that you are advocating with the mayor that money needs to be in, in this budget to increase the seats, right? I don't hear that, and that's how we get frustrated. We want to work with DYCD, and there's need to be coordination with DOE. Every single elementary school, I'm not even going to, you got the middle school part, but the middle school part is a little bit different, right? It's not five days a week. Kids kind of choose what program they want to participate in, um, and it's in the school or it's outside the school, and it's been very successful. I've gotten very positive respond, you know, feedback from the parents. They're great. But let's focus on the elementary school. Let's get to that point where every kid who needs one, needs a seat, gets it. And the providers are here. I mean, they're one, they're nonprofits who are charging. Get them into the portfolio so that we can make sure that families, you know, don't have to pay thousands of dollars and they can't afford it, but they have no choice because they don't want their kids to be, you know, running around the streets. So how do you coordinate with DOE to make sure that every single elementary school has an after-school program for every student that needs it? I mean, you told that, you, I mean, you answered Councilmember Kayla's question. You benefited from after school program, right? 
And I saw students of mine. Right now, I have, I've seen, I have a judge who was in my after school program. I have a DA who in, was in the after school program, business owner. The kids did well because there was an after school and summer program for them. So how do we get there? Do you guys talk about it in DYCD? We, listen, we talk about after school every single day, every hour. But do you hour, talk about getting day. to a point where every kid in the elementary school who needs it gets one? We definitely appreciate your passion and advocacy. We share your dream, your vision of of uh, after school for every young person who who wants it. We are 100% with you in that vision. We we work every day to make um, the best of after school, to make sure it's the highest quality, to make sure we're reaching as many young people as possible. We are 100% with you. We work very closely with Department of Education. When we do have additional resources, um, we work very closely with them to identify the school that that has the least and, and would benefit the most from an available resource. We're in very close communication with them to coordinate our resources so that we're maximizing the value to young people. We 100% we share your vision for after school. Well, I want to see that in this year's budget. Okay, if you share our vision, then we want to see something, we want to see concrete in the preliminary budget in this budget process. So when Commissioner Chong comes to the budget hearing, I want to hear him talking about projecting how much funding DYCD would need to get us another step further. Right, Council Member Rose? Okay, so you bring that back to the Commissioner. Will Thank do. you. Okay. You know, like after Council Member Chin, there's not very much more to say. However, you can't get off that easily. Um, I have a few more questions, um, Borough President. Is that okay? Um, uh, the committee, we've heard from the advocates that um, there's under enrollment in Sonic. Um, is, uh, is there under enrollment in the Sonic program? What is the um, complete budgeted number of middle school after school slots? Um, then I have a few more. Uh, no, um, Sonic has exceeded, um, enrollment in Sonic has exceeded the contracted seats as far as I can remember in every year over the course of the expansion. Um, there may be a few Sonic programs that um, that reach out for support for outreach to increase their enrollment, but overwhelmingly um, they are fully enrolled and exceeding enrollment targets. Um, currently, we are contracted for 51,000 seats, and we, over the years, have approached roughly 70,000 in enrollment in, for those seats. Do you have a wait list for Sonic? I think that question probably varies from provider to provider. The overwhelming majority of Sonic programs are meeting their targets and able to meet the need in the school. There are some programs that are over enrolled and um, we're aware of some programs that have a wait list. It's a, it's a small percentage of the overall Sonic portfolio. Um, there's a separation of approximately 18,000 slots for middle school, after school from Sonic. Can you Why? say that again? There, um, there's an, um, a separation of approximately 18,000 slots for a middle school, um, after school from Sonic, from the Sonic program. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you mean by that, like the separation of um, seats. So before Sonic, the, um, there was an after school program um, that had slots, approximately 18,000 slots that are separate from your Sonic 51,000. Do you still 
hold those after school slots? I, I would I would like to discuss this offline just to make sure I understand um, the question. I think what I think the 18,000 rings true as the number of young people who were served in middle school after school programs prior to the middle school expansion. Were those, they rolled in? Absolutely, those were rolled in and um, Sonic is actually offered five days a week after school and it's a more rust pro program than it was prior to this administration, but when the expansion happened, all of those contracts were brought up to the same price and robust um, level of service as the expansion seats were. So it's one model now for all the Sonic apps. And what is that cost? What is the cost per, 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 per participant? Again, that varies now based on um, provider we um, still have people at the two different rates. We, st the, we still have some the people. The 2012 rate and. We still have um, people at two different rates based on whether or not there's an educational specialist on, on board. But what I'm speaking to more is the um, adjustments that the investments the administration made mm -hmm. based on like wage, wage adjustments and and now um, indirect, there'll be a varying, varying prices. Have all of the programs been told that um, they should get an educational specialist on board so that they could get the, the higher rate? It's a factor of the request for proposal that they responded to. So it's, if they have a contract um, in, re in response to the RFP that that it required that, then they do, and if not, then they, um, the city council funded programs that were baselined didn't have the educational specialist as part of the program model. The DYCD funded um, contracts had that as part of their core um, How do we model. bring them up to the, the, a comparable rate, which is 32, right? at the new the newer rate the old rate is 28 how you know they responded to the previous RFP there hasn't been a new RFP so how do we get them up to the same the same rate I think that's a really important question that is part of the planning to go forward in in creating a new model for compass will work that out in our stakeholder engagement I think that's okay. Important. So we're back to that timeline about this RFP and these conversations. Yes. That we're not we're, we're looking to happen before 2022. Yes. Yes, we're planning to initiate that very soon. Okay. Um, is funding for Compass NYC and, and Sonic reimbursable? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, funding for Compass and Sonic, collect, it used to be out of school time, remained relatively steady from 50, uh, fiscal year 18 to 20 at approximately 340 million, yet the number of participant slots decreased from 126, uh, 126,000 in fiscal year 18 to 122,000 in fiscal year 19, and a targeted 110,000 in fiscal year 20. Can you explain how relatively steady funding has led to flu fewer slots over these years? And does this reduction in slots improve program quality or simply serve fewer, fewer youth? And, and how did you derive um, a targeted number as 110,000 for fiscal year 2020? In the MMR, our targeted seats is roughly the number of seats that we're funding. The contracted number of seats available is, is, is our target um, or something very close to that. We report in the MMR total enrollment and very often our providers are able to serve more than we, um, than, the target, than the number of funded seats we contract with. We report all that enrollment in the mayor's management report. 
And um, I think you um, are referring to comparison, did you say 18 to 19 in the Mayor's Management Report? There was a slight um, drop, still far exceeding the number of funded contracted seats in Compass. And we, we, we are, I think that that is attributed to the fact, as I mentioned in our testimony, we launched a, a brand new data system, DYCD Connect. Any one of our providers is utilizing this new system. And there was a learning curve for providers for like where they had previously been using the same system for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, they were they were learning a new and we think it's less likely that they actually served fewer young people there was no reduction in service no cut to contracts then that there may have been some bumps in learning the new system and we've already seen and expect to see in this fiscal year the second year of the of utilizing that new system that those numbers are back to prior levels What kind of system did you put in place that they couldn't keep track of the number of students that were enrolled? Oh no, um, it's it's a, it's a beautiful IT system, but I'm just talking about anything as simple as like your how, login but or. My question is, how did they lose, in, you know, the number of students that the number of participants they had? If you're saying they were actually there, is that what you're saying? Look, that they I don't they know. Were actually They're, there. But um, we saw a decline in enrollment. I, I'm not sure how, how does that happen. And it's a significant number. And you're saying it's because of some learning curve for the data? It was 3%. It was a 3% dip, which still left us far above the number of contracted seats for Compass. It wasn't a significant dip. And I don't know exactly across the system of 900 programs, like what caused that dip. I think we can, we can learn more about that in discussions with providers. But I guess that it's not an accident that that was also the year where they, where they had previously, I don't, you know, you use IT systems, you're using one and you're fluent in it and everything is, is perfect. You adjust to a new system and it may um, impact your, your fluency, which we already have seen an uptick. Is it possible that they just had a dip in the number of served? That seems unlikely to us, um, but we can, we're happy to discuss that with you further. We just, we just didn't account for 4,000 uh, participants in, in that year because of a new system. That's what you're saying. I know we exceeded our targets and our contracted numbers in Compass, um, I don't have an affirmative reason why system-wide we saw a little dip. I don't. But, I don't. And then, um, oh, just adding, just, uh, one of the things that we see when we migrate systems, and again, imagine that Compass, between Compass Beacon and Cornerstone, there's over 3,000 staff that are trained in our internal systems. And that year during the migration, we were doing the trainings. And again, we, we don't have the systematic um, investigation on this, but you would imagine that some of that dip is attributed to um, the training of staff, tr staff getting it to the sites, entering the data into the system, that that could have been part of that drop off. Um, so can you tell me why um, you targeted um, uh, only 110,000 uh, participants are targeted for 2020? When in 2018, we were, um, we were sa serving 126,000. Well, I think technically speaking, a hundred. Why are we serving less? A hundred and ten. You mean why don't we lift the target? How did you How did you come to this targeted number of a hundred and ten thousand versus you know more than uh, we were We were serving more than that. Yes, we and, are. And we still are. Previous years when we were giving less money into the budget. Um, I don't know if I followed that budget point, but we, we, we are, again, to the point about whether Sonic is enrolled, we have traditionally exceeded, our providers have traditionally exceeded the number of contracted seats in their programs. We have continued to do that even last year and the years before, and we anticipate we'll continue to do that. 
when we're setting our targets, um, you know, we do look at past actuals. We don't go too far beyond what we're paying in contracted providers and our targets, but we want to represent when they are able to serve more than we give them a contract for. So we, we, we like to include the true enrollment number, not capped at the number of um, contracted seats they have, but to reflect the true number of young people who are benefiting from the service. We're going to have an offline conversation. Excellent. Um, school capacity. You know, how many elementary, middle school, and high schools do not have DYCD funded after school programs? We have some rough numbers on that. Um, bear with me one second. Roughly speaking, there are about 1,800 schools. And um, roughly speaking, we are serving about 880, almost 900 of those schools with a city-funded after-school program. Um, approximately 550 of those are DYCD-funded programs, and roughly 330 of them are Department of Education programs which leaves about 1,000 schools without a city-funded after-school program. Um, do, you, um, do you know how many uh, have uh, 21st century uh, grants? 20 Th those are included in the count those, of the those are DOE federal. numbers. Those are the D Those are administered the by Department numbers? of Education, yeah. Okay. Um, and how many young people are on the wait list for Compass NYC programs? And do you know by which grade, which school level, elementary, middle school, and high school? You know, that's an interesting question. We haven't in the past had a way to give data on the number of young people who aren't able to be served in our programs. We have initiated this new um, comprehensive data system allows um, for the first time the public to apply to a program online. And we think that that will allow us to assess demand a little more concretely. We've been asked these questions by council um, for many years, and we haven't had mm -hmm. like a systematic way to report on that. Uh, we just recently launched this feature, so it would be new to the, the, the beginning of a new after-school cycle, and we, we're mm -hmm. looking forward to monitoring that. But right now, you could go get a map of the city, look at the programs closest to you, identify a few that you're interested in, submit an application right there online, and follow your status, whether they're responding you to come in and fill out more complete information, whether you're ultimately enrolled, or whether you're put on a wait list. And so we anticipate in the future to have better data on um, on those numbers by program. And then someone is going to input um, the data that says that they've been enrolled or not? Yes. Okay. Okay. Have you had many principals or how many principals or school officials have asked DYC to establish after school programs? Do you have any, any um, data on that? I could get back to you on that. We do keep track when people ask um, about programs. Yeah, we can get back to you on that. Is there any coordination with your STEM, your Compass NYC STEM program with um, the private sector? Um, and do you have mentors from the private sector working with these programs? So we have many STEM efforts, I think, to get to your question. Um, one of the efforts that we did over time um, was we worked with the New York Academy of Sciences to um, place uh, grad students and postdocs into our after school programs to actually imp train our staff, but also implement the curriculum across our programming. So that's everything from robotics, um, there was some DNA study, I mean, um, curriculum activities going on, um, but a myriad of STEM curriculum that, were be, that was being implemented within our programs. We also have other um, direct initiatives that we um, fund. So we have one called Lego My Lego, which is our citywide robotics um, competition where 
of young people are trained through our partnership with the U.S. Robo I mean, FIRST Robotics mm -hmm. um, to implement a robotics curriculum throughout the program year. Um, they create robots, learn how to code, and then we bring them together for a culmination at the end of the year. But that's just two of our efforts. Do we have any programs, and, and if so, how many, um, that address the needs of students with other abilities? Um, we have people with different types of learning abilities, um, autism, things, you know, other abilities that, um, do we have any programs that work with special pro um we do. Special we population. do have we have programs that specialize in working After with um, children with special needs, and we have programs that include um, children with special needs and work in like a more integrated fashion. I'm trying to think. Um, Children's Aid Society, I can think off the top of my head, runs a program for um, blind young people, I believe. Um, are they listed? Are they listed in your your database where you know um, a parent might be able to access those programs? We we have search words on our programs. Um, we're we're going to get back to you and double check the search words to help the public find a suitable program. Okay. One of the yeah just adding on one of the features of Discover DYCD is that a parent can go and. I, two additions to this. One, a parent can go in and create a profile. So they can create a profile for the household, um, multiple age young people in the household, from the teenager down to the elementary age young person, and apply for programs based on their age and also see what's available and what they um, are eligible for. In addition to that, um, anyone from the public can search against keywords for programming. So if you're looking for a photography program or a GED task program, you can help find that by, by keyword search as well. And I know that's up and running, right? That's correct. And um, I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, our special um, populations are also that they, you know, that the information is there for them to access. So also. it's possible to put it in there. I think we want to get back to you because we want to ensure that um, the providers are actually labeling it that way and putting the, those keywords in there. I don't want to say yes, that it's in there, and they haven't done so. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. You almost got away. Blame it on, blame it on, you know, my counsel. Um, <laughs> not yet. Intro um, 1113 would require reporting on after school programming, including the demographics of students served and participation data. What obstacles do you see in collecting the data required by this bill? What information do providers currently collect and report to DYCD regarding their programs and students? And is there any other information that's not specified in the bill? that would be useful for DYCD to collect in connection with this after-school programming? So I believe throughout this discussion, um, you see that we do share the data, the goals around data transparency and access and using data to inform programming. Um, we believe that the majority of what we do have out in the public now fulfills the goals of the bill um, through, through our technology efforts. So two efforts, one is DYCD Connect, Again, that's the internal management system that our providers are using to enroll participants, attach them to activities, um, take their daily attendance and, and manage their daily programming. Um, also, of course, we spoke about in length, Discover DYCD, where the public uh, are able to go on, apply for programming, create that profile I just mentioned, um, and learn about our services and identify services and apply for services um, for their household. We do see that some of the data, some of the data that the bill calls for, we don't currently um, collect. It's, mm -hmm. For us, it's confidential data that we don't collect. Um, and we also feel that uh, around the bill that detailing some of the site-specific demographic information and information may create a confidentiality um, issue at different sites. And that's something that we would love to speak with you offline about. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, we definitely need to talk about that. Um, you see, as we, I'm, as I'm, we you see, I'm frowning. In, 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 indeed. As we disaggregate the data by site, 
now you know at different sites the population being served. And again, for public available consumption, that could be a confidentiality issue for the groups mm -hmm. of people who we are serving at different sites. But if the council, if anyone wants access to data, that's something that we've been working with you guys mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. offline and that we can continue that. But I would love to get into details around that mm -hmm. um, offline. Well, maybe that part of it um, would sort of be um, inured into it that it's not a part of the public, the, the public record, but um, city council would have access. You want a special login? Yeah. I'm joking. No, but no, we, we should speak. Okay. Um, is there anything that you think um, the bill should include that it did not? in terms of data that should be collected? No, again, I believe that we, in what we do collect and put out to the public, we do fulfill the majority of, I guess, what the bill, the spirit of the bill is calling for. Okay, and um, these are a quick yes or no. Um, at the prior hearing in October 20, uh, 2018, DYCD testified that it was in the beginning stages of digitizing its, digitizing its uh, data collection systems. What's the status of the project? And how has this project streamlined data and information collection? And what is the estimated cost to fully complete the project? So that, if you're referring to our, the management system we're using, Discover, DYCD Connect and Discover DYCD, Mission accomplished? It's mission accomplished, okay. Well, again, we are continuously um, innovating that, those systems. Uh, oh. For instance, like Discover DYCD 2.0 just released, which now allows the profile creation, the search of our programs, and then the actual applying for our programs um, within that session. Okay, and um, do you collaborate with your not-for-profits on after-school program design? Yes, absolutely. You do? Um, through stakeholder engagement, we have a series of focus groups, um, meetings with providers, mm -hmm. continuously to ensure that we are collecting Does information. this collaboration include rates? <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah? Yeah. They do, yes. Okay, and it is, it is a part of the conversations that you have in the budget when you talk about the budget? It's not, you just don't use the, you just don't ask them for feedback about the rates. You actually then take it and move it on so that it becomes a real conversation. So, yes, mm -hmm. ordinarily during the, the, the creation of a concept paper or creation of an RFP, that's part of the process. For instance, um, when we went through the feedback sessions for the Beacon RFP, um, where I know the history of it, uh, at one point, beacons were funded at 400,000. During the last administration, they got cut down to an average of 340,000 per beacon, which is not enough to operate a beacon program, of course. Um, this administration made a huge investment, but one, through the feedback that we received through community engagement, engagement with the stakeholders, and now on average, beacons are funded at $610,000 a year. All right, thank you. We're gonna, you're gonna get back to me about how we're gonna equalize the um, the two groups that are getting one's getting twenty eight hundred per per participant and the others getting the thirty two right okay thank you and thank you for your for testifying today and thank you borough president Brewer for being so patient um, the mic is now yours. And I want to mention that uh, Council Member Eugene had joined us. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Whenever you're ready. DYCD is so polite. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway. I was raised by after school program. I, I can see. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I certainly want to thank uh, Youth Services Chair uh, Deborah, Debbie Rose, and certainly Council Members Chin and Kalos and everyone who's been here in the past. And it is an honor to testify today. One of the reasons I wanted to be here 
is as the borough president, I have to say going to the schools, this is why this hearing is so important, there are two requests from the principals. One, for the elementary schools, as has been discussed over and over, I don't have an after school program. It is the number one request, and the second is for a social worker, which is not part of this hearing, but it's something that you have taken up. After school, as you have said, Madam Chair, and certainly others, certainly uh, Council Member Chin, is the number one request when they don't have it, particularly for the Title I schools. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm always in favor, as you are, of more youth programs. There should be after-school opportunities in every school and programs throughout our neighborhoods. And I just want to add, sometimes the problem is there's like three days a week, and that doesn't help if you work. And sometimes it's not free, and then there's a scholarship. But the problem is not everybody, A, there's not enough money for the scholarship, and it becomes them and us. And there's a very strange dynamic that takes place. So, and as you indicated, the middle school program is working because that is constantly cited. How is it that the middle schools, thank you, Mr. Mayor, we do appreciate that, but what about us on the elementary school? And as speaking just for myself, what it does is it drives parents to the charter schools which have after school. So for many, many reasons, this hearing is incredibly important. Um, I'm on the same track as you are, and by connecting schools and programs and providing this small amount of discretionary money that we have as borough presidents, we try to support the after school. We obviously advocate for more programming. Just to give you some uh, statistics, uh, we work with something called Beta NYC, which is housed in our office. Uh, they do nothing but work on data. Um, and in Manhattan, there are about 160 providers, according to uh, Beta NYC, running about 1,100 programs, but that's for young people of all ages. And we all know it's not just about the number of programs, but the quality, providing services is good, but ultimately long-term youth development, that word is so important, programming, must help our youth to succeed and our community thrive, and you know that already. Uh, we have a rich history of research-based youth programming in New York City, and I'm pleased that Commissioner Chung has continued it. Programs that provide caring relationships and engaging activities, programs that promote high expectations, that offer opportunity for young people to contribute, and that provide continuity. Programs that don't focus on fixing problems, but rather build on the strength of each young person, these are the programs that can make a lasting difference, but they have to exist in order to make that lasting existence. We know how to do it with initiatives like the Beacon Program, born under Mayor Dinkins and Youth Commissioner Richard Murphy, who was my idol. It is a national model. Beacons integrate programs, family, preservation, health, empowerment, sports for a greater effect. Every program we fund doesn't have to provide it all but we need to obey, uh, be able to identify gaps and bring together those services, supports, and opportunities that can meet the goals of our young people and help them excel. And after uh, school STEM program, which you brought up, Madam Chair, may be a great resource for some young people, but it could serve even more youth and be even more effective if, if it's connected to counseling and career advisement and the arts. I'm a big believer in STEAM, as I'm sure you are. We are always concerned that a young person might drop out of a program if he or she faces a life trauma, and we shouldn't have to scramble to find services for that young person. A good youth development program will help that young person to be resilient, and integrated services will ensure proper intervention and support, but you need services in order to have all of this. We also need to remove some of the barriers to providing youth programming. A new initiative that allows borough presidents the ability to waive some school usage, usage fees for some programs is helpful, and we've been using that. But all schools should be available for programming every afternoon and evening, seven days a week, 32 weeks a year. An open school building can host several programs in an evening, ultimately saving money for everyone. And, and I just want to emphasize that. We talked about after school, but I am finding that there isn't enough uh, Saturday and Sunday. If we can, I consider that after school. 
um, in the community centers, many of whom providers are here today, um, it did exist. Something's happened um, in the last, I don't know if it's six years or 10 years, I don't want to get into a Bloomberg versus de Blasio discussion. But the fact of the matter is, there used to be more weekend and evening in the neighborhood, not just in the school, and there's some change there. Um, I, we absolutely have to have these community centers, particularly those that are near NYCHA developments, open on the weekends and into the evening, preferably until 11 p.m. Um, so we want NYCHA community centers, and we want senior centers if necessary, uh, and libraries to be used more frequently. The hours have been cut. Libraries, yes, are open thanks to you. More hours, but they need more. If a senior center closes at four o'clock, an evening youth program can be placed there. I know, I know, I know. Sharing space is not easy. I know teachers feel that way. But it's not impossible, particularly when programs support each other and are compatible. As Richard Murphy said, and he pointed out, our youth spend only a small percentage of their time in school. It's an important percentage. But ultimately, to ensure the well-being of our young people, we need to provide adequate resources and quality programming for all young people during non-school hours, including the weekends. This is not as simple as homework help or midnight basketball. This is about hiring quality staff. I wanted to say one thing about the door, where I'm a huge supporter, as an example, to unionize staff. And it is very, very long-term. And when you go to ask why does the door work, yes, it has a youth component. You are very much in charge, but the other issue is long-term staff and it's unionized. So this is about hiring quality staff that stay because they're paid enough, offering a range of well-integrated opportunities and ensuring that appropriate supports are available in all of our programs. So just so you know, in the Manhattan Borough President's Office, we are analyzing the data of the programs I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony, and we're trying to ensure that existing youth programming is offered at the hours when it is needed the most. Um, and then we'll try to fill the gap. So I'm simply here to say congratulations on the two pieces of legislation, um, and more importantly, um, there is something desperately missing in terms of our after-school programs for the Title I schools that are elementary, and there's something desperately missing with the opportunity for weekend and later into the evening for our um, community-based organizations, many of which are here today. Most recently in East Harlem we met because there are a high incidence in terms of the CompSat numbers for NYPD, and it turns out that programs hours have been cut. So, and also turns out that although we have many programs for homework and sports and so on, there's no central place where young people can gather and be themselves. And that is also a component similar to the door where you can have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, where you can have a youth-centered opportunities and you can just hang out, get health services if you need it. And I think that's something that we need to be looking at in every single neighborhood. So thank you very much for this important hearing, and it's really an honor to be here, and your issues are real. Thank you. Thank you so much, Borough President. I wanted to ask you, you said that you, um, you uh, sometimes pay a fee, you waive, uh, to, to waive, I guess, the opening fees for the school? Yep. Um, is that fee uh, pretty, um, is it the same for each school? Does it vary? Um, and, and approximately what, you know, what, what is that fee? I, I would have to get back to you. I can say that it was started to the credit of the Brooklyn Borough President, making a fuss about some of the fact, it is outrageous that youth programs have to pay, and they used to have to pay exorbitant fees to go right, into to the open. schools. Right. So we have been able, I think we've gotten a lot of calls, we've been able to waive whatever that school fee was, obviously working with the custodian, but I could get back to you as to the exact amount. It's true in all five boroughs. Mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be helpful. Mr. Otto should be using this opportunity. If he is not, and I will tell him right now, Jimmy <laughs> Otto, <laughs> you know how I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Borough President. Um, yeah, I, that that number I think would be helpful. Yeah, uh, 
So uh, I thank you, and I thank you for doing that, and and for the borough presidents that that are doing it. And I totally um, agree with you that all of the Title I schools um, elementary uh, should, um, and our our community schools should be able to utilize um, the services also. So I thank you so much. Uh, thank and you, um, Council Member Kalos would like to ask. Thank you. Manhattan Borough President Gail yes. Brewer. Yes, Council was, Member Kalos. This your, is an ongoing discussion and joke, so just so you know. Go what ahead. What was your <laughs> favorite after school program when you were a child? Oh God, I have no idea. What did I do? I can't remember. I don't remember, it was too long ago. No. <laughs> Let the record reflect that uh, the borough president refused to answer this I question did. on the... <laughs> I have no uh, idea it was so long you, ago. Uh, so can you share a little bit of the structure of the after schools that you see in Manhattan where yep. some schools are actually able to get it for free from nonprofit yep. providers uh, and get it through DYCD versus others where it's funded by PTA yep. uh, and uh, where some of them charge in the school for the after school versus can you just. Yeah, I mean, I think you brought up, I think the, the chair brought up the 21st century. Well, guess what? It's only a three-year program, I believe. And when it ends, then everybody's running around trying to get money for something that is equally quality and free. I mean, I've had that in like three or four schools. And for some reason, they weren't uh, apprised in a timely fashion. So that's an example. It's a great program. The second would be... I can't tell you how many times it is, understandably, either a nonprofit or a for-profit, I have to say, unfortunately. And in that case, uh, as good as the services may be, they are often charged to the parents, even in Title I schools, I'm afraid to say. And there is scholarships, but not enough. And it's a very uh, them and us. Uh, what, so I see a lot of that. Then I see literally um, having to walk the young people because there isn't an after-school program in that school to something that's nearby, right? And it doesn't work. You know, you have to figure out how, who the teacher is going to do it, pay that teacher uh, per session, and, it, and then there is, again, parents who are uncomfortable with that taking place. You have safety issues. Um, in some cases, believe it or not, we have pre-K. Pre-K does not have after school. Um, many of the centers that are in the neighborhood can't take pre-K. Boys and girls, for instance, can't take pre-K under their uh, mandate. So this, there's a real lack of comprehensive vision for the elementary schools. It's a hodgepodge, and I think that's why your bills are so important. Universal makes sense. Um, I get so many complaints on this topic. It's, it's almost, you're calling for universal after school. I'm saying there's a universal complaint about after school for elementary. Uh, devil's argument, uh, the devil's advocate, and I've actually already gotten this question multiple times. Uh, what, should universal should after school be for all children in our public school, regardless of socioeconomic status, uh, or should children from families that can quote unquote afford it uh, be have to pay a fee, or should it be just universal? I mean, I would model. Well, I hope I'm correct on this. In the middle school, middle school, as I understand it, is Title I. Everybody in a Title I school has an after school program. At least start with that for the elementary. I have, L I have Title I schools with no after-school program, or one or two days a week. That doesn't work. So that, I think that's where I would start. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Thank you much, very much. Borough President. As always, very insightful. Um, so now, the moment we've been waiting for, um, we will have... Uh, why do you have me write, reading these Sorry. names? <laughs> the next panel will be Erica Mason from CHLDC, Robert Abbott, Cypress Hills LDC, um, Tara Lynn Little from Expanded Schools, Mary Shang 
from CPC uh, readers, re ready readers, I'm sorry. And Deanna Sue Lawrenson from St. Nick's Alliance. And Chesty Hudgens from Canva. Wow, do we have enough chairs? You might have to squeeze in, get a little close. There's a lot of settling in time. <laughs> when you're ready, please identify yourself and your organization. Not on, am I on? Hi, I'm Deborah Sue Lorenzo, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education at St. Nick's Alliance, and we are the largest youth services provider in North Brooklyn. Um, thank you for all you've done to support the youth services field in New York City. It's been extraordinary to be part of this world for the last long time. Let's <laughs> just say that. Um, you know, and also thank you for the opportunity to testify <coughs> on behalf of... I just want to um, say, we're going to try to give everybody three minutes. So okay. if you could, like, really hold tight to it. We have 26 people. Okay. You got it. Thank, Thank you. Um, we're here as a community to testify that um, the Compass After School Centers are a critical part of the solution to help every child achieve their academic potential, beginning with reading at grade level. St. Nick's Alliance um, and my colleagues here who will be speaking about the Ready Readers program have designed literacy models that are specifically for the after school space that are allowing our after school children to succeed at a very high level. For example, at St. Nick's Alliance, 63% of the children in after school are reading at grade level compared to 42% of their peers at the same schools. I'm gonna pass the mic on to Canva. Hi, I'm Christy Hodgkins, Senior Vice President for Education and Youth Development at Canva. And together with Expand Ed Schools, CPC, and uh, Cypress Hills, uh, we have been in a collaborative since about 2014 with our Ready Readers Initiative. And um, this is a literacy enrichment model that was designed to enhance reading engagement and excitement about reading and higher order uh, reading comprehension skills, primarily for kindergarten through third graders. And that was in alignment with um, the city's initiative of having every kid on grade level in terms of reading by third grade. And um, we have further developed a model for fourth and fifth graders, which we call rising readers. Um, and that was really born out of, one, the kids being very excited and wanting to continue with the literacy, uh, with the literacy enrichment. And just briefly to say that um, last year we had close to 2,000 children participating across our collaborative and that 56% demonstrated growth at a pace that exceeded the expectations for their grade level, um, which is very, very exciting. I'm turning it over to you now, yeah, Tara Lynn. So. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Tara Lynn Little. I am the Early Literacy Manager with Expanded Schools. Um, before I talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about our programs, just wanted to share from a personal experience. I, myself, am a native New Yorker, I'm from Jamaica, Queens, born and raised, um, and have experienced the after school programming from really all different lenses that you can as a participant going to after school from the ages of five um, in my native Queens. Um, at 14, it was my first job when I got my little green working paper slips um, back in the day um, and really built my career up through the after school space before becoming a classroom teacher and then returning to the after school space as a program developer and trainer. Um, and so I've had a chance to really witness the power of after school as a participant, as an employee, um, and as a classroom teacher, being able to see what the after school programs provided to my students that they weren't necessarily getting through the day, during the day. Um, so wholeheartedly believe in the power of after school, having experienced it from all those different lenses. 
Um, like St. Nick, our um, Ready and Rising Readers Collaborative um, really believes that after school is a powerful space for all students, but especially for literacy enrichment, um, which we know is important, not only for their success in school, but also life and what I also believe is a social justice issue for our students as well. Um, and so with that in mind, our Ready and Rising Readers programs really focus on training community educators who work at community-based organizations and bringing literacy enrichment programs to students that are joyful, that are meaningful, um, and not only support the skills that they're learning during the school day, but also take advantage of what's unique about the after-school space. And so with Ready Readers, which um, targets our kindergarten through third grade students, are, they're engaging in meaningful interactive read-aloud programs where they are learning new vocabulary. They are having discussions and interactions with their peers using comprehension questions. Um, and after each book, also engage in an activity um, that really helps them extend the learning of the book. And so that might be an arts-based activity. It might be performing. It might be STEM. But they're engaging in a creative activity to extend the learning. Um, and then with rising readers, those are student-led choice-based literature circles for our fourth and fifth grade students. So that's really the pipeline or the next step of what our students are getting in K through third. Um, and just to close up, through these programs, we are really seeing that not only are we supporting their literacy skills that they're learning during the school day, but these programs also support positive identity development. They're supporting cultural competence. They're supporting social emotional learning. Um, and we focus our book selection on this concept of mirrors and windows and really students seeing themselves through literature and also learning about the world as they're developing their literacy skills. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to some of my colleagues to talk about what the impact has been, but wanted to share the experience we're trying to craft for students and why we think that's so important across New York City. And thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Erica Mason from Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. Uh, Turn your microphone on, please. I'm Erica Mason from Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, and I'm following Tara Lynn's testimony because one of our pillars for Ready Readers and Rising Readers is professional development for our staff. And um, every year we have our staff fill out a survey at the end of the year for, uh, to give them time to reflect on the experiences of the students as well as their own experiences. And I'm going to read a couple quotes that I have from those surveys so we could get a good picture on what our students and staff experience in the literacy programming. So Kayvon reported that um, I learned that there is more to books than words and pictures. I like reading a lot more myself than I did when I was in school. I'm proud that my students are actually receiving life tools while reading and growing into themselves. My students have a plethora of new words as well as their meanings that they're able to use properly in their own writing pieces. Karen reported that she's proud to say that after homework help, some students will grab a book and start reading. They'll hold the book up as I do and read the pictures to their classmates. They get excited when I say it's ready reader's time. Uh, Ashley stated that showing the kids the importance of reading books has made me read more in my own free time. Kids have learned to use the vocabulary we taught them in Ready Readers and learned to like reading and appreciate the fun in it. And Teddy said, students have learned more about diversity and differences in people from the books we read in Ready Readers. I believe they've grown to understand that not everyone has to look the same to be friends. And finally, um, Hasley reported that my students have learned many more vocabulary words. I focused on the themes of kindness and respect, and I'm proud that they've taken what they've learned and shown it within their very own classroom. So the experiences for the students as well as the staff have been very impactful in this approach to literacy programming. Thank you, Chair Deborah L. Rose and members of City Council for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Mary Cheng, Director of Childhood Development Services at CPC, Chinese American Planning Council. Um, Chinese American Planning Council's Childhood Development Services believes that all children, their families, and society benefits from a high quality childhood programming, and that there is a critical link between a child's early experience and later life successes. I'm one of those successes. I went through after school at CPC, came back, taught, continued to serve in CPC. And I want to provide those same enrichment and empowerment activities for my children and for all the children in the community that we service. Um, so I'm grateful to testify on the issues that impact individual families and the children that we serve. 
and grateful for the council for their leadership on these issues. We believe that universal after school is needed to promote educational equity and access and to ensure the children's safety. Because the city relies on community organizations to deserve, deliver these after school programs, we hope that the city will fully fund universal after school contracts. The city should develop a price per participant that ensures program quality, includes living wage for staff, and supports professional development. Professional development being key in this matter. And I think that's why Ready Readers has been so successful in terms of it, and also indirect expenses. A robust program ensures that children and families will have a quality and culturally competent program. One key example is the Ready Readers program. Um, as collaborators since 2015 on this program, this cohort between Expand Debt Schools, Cypress Hills, L Cypress Hills LDC, and Canva, funded by Brooke Astor Grant of New York Community Trust. We are asking that the New York City Council urge DYCD and the Mayor's Office to continue to fund literacy model in the next Compass and Sonic RFP. Ready Readers is a proven model and that could be replicated through the next um, RFP. Overall, Ready Readers has increased student acquisition of reading comprehension skills necessary to succeed in later grades through the integration of reading, writing, and speaking, and listening in the structures uh, that develops an understanding of big ideas and ensures time for practice in the after-school setting, making it very um, effective in terms of that as well as it's become a high potential for pathway for retention rate for the staff. Um, we've had teaching, teaching staff who have now gone into the field of teaching to give back to the community as well. So we're really proud of that. Um, and so 97% of the educators have increased their confidence um, delivering reading comprehension instruction over the year. And we have 75, 73% who are indicating that they would like to stay in the field of childhood education in, within this field. So we hope that you can continue your progress and fight for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, do you have any suggestions um, for how DYCD could better, could better support you as providers? Um, and if you Maybe I can speak to that. Oh, I'm sorry. I, it, 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 I am so sorry. It segues well. Your He's question segues well with my testimony. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak to a little bit of that. Uh, uh, good morning. I, I'm Rob Abbott. I work at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. We're a multi-services organization serving Cypress Hills in East New York, Brooklyn. We've provide, been providing after school programs since 1988 uh, and currently have 1,700 uh, seats in programs in partnership with 12 community school district 19 schools. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Rose and the Youth Services Committee for the opportunity to speak. Um, Cypress Hills is in full support of greater access to after school programs. Our elementary programs in particular have always run ready, waiting lists. We believe school aid child care should be a right. But what I'm here to highlight is the current crisis precipitated by the regulators of licensed school aid child care and the lessons that crisis can provide for those in government and its partners who care about safe, high quality, and accessible school aid child care. Um, in August of this year, we became aware of the Dear Provider letter uh, from OCFS detailing the overhaul of the cleared system for staff of SAC programs. We held nine licenses and did not receive that letter directly for, for any of those licenses. Um, we complied with state regs with the one-week turnaround. To date, we have not received a clearance letter for one, none. Uh, no new staff person hired since September 20, 25th. We have almost 50 pending staff people and 300 children waiting for childcare. We have heard about a 45-day turnaround promised on staff clearances. We are up to 100 days in counting. While DOHMH has been building their capacity to implement this new system, they have sent inspectors out to conduct inspections, including proof of clearance. Carrying violations on licenses can interfere with re reimbursement on government contracts and thus add to the already heavy burden on nonprofit organizations. Attrition among after school staff is not just season to season, it's within season. Many of our staff are college students whose schedules change in the middle of the year. 
Hemorrhaging of staff cannot be stemmed by our placements when the clearance system is in gridlock. Every week, the gridlock continues, and it continues now. This is ongoing. Children in SAC programs are less safe. As the after-school system in New York City has grown, providers have not seen evidence that the system to support it, including DOHMH, have grown with it. Licensees have experienced DOHMH as often inefficient, uncooperative, and reactive. The current crisis is an acute system of the chronic issue of lack of systems integration that puts providers in a bind and makes SAC programs less accessible to families. This issue needs attention now and as the system grows. I'd also like to point out that the summer component of SAC programs rely on summer youth employees and the summer youth employment program for the influx of staff necessary to be able to take children on field trips to playgrounds and parks and swimming. This is a budgetary necessity and also provides thousands of, S of SYPs with meaningful employment. With thousands of school-age child, school child care staff currently waiting clearance, there's a second crisis looming affecting more systems that serve New York City young people. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, and it bothers me to hear that any programming <coughs> is uh, being impeded by bureaucratic um, inefficiencies. Um, I'll be nice. Um, uh, it is a, a, it's a federal regulation that came down and it is being um, monitored by DOH. Yes, ma'am. It's for a law passed in 2014 um, that New York State didn't implement. Um, and then obviously lots of things clearly happened. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think our point is that the impact of dealing with kind of how that went down between 2014 and then yes. an automatic turnaround that DOHMH is not even yet as of today, mm -hmm. prepared to address, right? We literally have gotten not one clearance letter. Um, the impact is on providers and children and families. And that's the yes. reality we're dealing uh, with right now. I, I appreciate um, your concern. And, um, and uh, while I have no oversight over that, um, I am willing as the chair to, to write a letter. Thank just you so to much. express, you know, our concern and our displeasure and and this uh, Thank you so much. really inefficient. Um, whatever. Oh, uh, I am so good. I already wrote a letter to the commissioner. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you Rose. very much. Wow. Thank How's you, that for a government <laughs> response? That is, good, that is good response. That's, that's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's, okay. And, and the chair, and I've been informed that the chair of our health commi committee has also uh, met with the DOA, DOH. Um, yes, chair. Um. So I want to jump in. Uh, I'm, I'm the, I, in addition to being a sponsor of this bill with uh, Youth Services Chair Rose, I'm also the contracts chair. So relating to a lot of the concerns that have been brought up, you already have a commitment from me to it's actually really easy when you're working with Debbie Rose uh, to work with our youth, youth services chair to support you. And so uh, inside of this hearing, we'll continue to work with folks and with your coalition to make sure folks are getting paid on time and that the indirect rates are being respected and will work. Uh, I just had a, a quick question across the board, uh, just in terms of what your current capacity is and uh, what your capacity to scale might be given the already uh, rapid expansion of middle school and so as we try to figure out how to phase it in what what do you think the right phase in would be in over what time if we are successful are you race are you speaking about universal um, after school uh, for, for yes so in terms of prioritizing elementary the borough president mentioned prioritizing title one but I think one of the questions that DYCD asked was about uh, provider capacity and they kind of pointed pointed towards your group so this is I think a question I'd like to just ask of everyone of just wh where you currently are uh, 
uh, and where you, where you feasibly could be, especially if you knew that there was going to be continued funding, not just like, here's some money, do all of it without getting paid more. <laughs> so um, I think the getting paid more component, um, I do believe that the next RFP that comes out from DYCD needs to take into account um, the need to uh, provide enhanced uh, staff development for all of our youth workers to build capacity within the field. I think that's a really critical component of any kind of expansion. With the sonic expansion, um, and even with the expanded number of slots, all of that translates to a need for um, more youth workers. Um, and it's a low wage job. It is minimum wage to 15 to $18 um, an hour. And um, one of the ways that we can foster retainment is really giving, creating pipelines and pathways for career development um, and uh, creating a more enriching experience for them as they grow in their young adulthood. I would just add, um, you know, providers' capacity is directly related to, um, you know, what the health of the other systems that are out there. So Rob has talked about the challenges with the background check clearances with OCFS. Um, you know, there's also uh, a lot of delay and runaround with the Department of Education's pets clearance. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that these minimum wage employees, um, college students, some high school students have to be fingerprinted and fully cleared by the Department of Health, uh, OCFS, and also the Department of Education, which if you've read in the news recently, um, they've acknowledged a huge backlog uh, in, in the clearances that they need uh, to do. So I think that, you know, I think we all support universal after school, but there needs to be a real stepping up in the systems that support us in being able to go into schools because we can't bring children on board if we have staff who are not fully cleared to work, to work with them. I would just add that, you know, um, uh, Councilman Kalos, that uh, your bill address, we would uh, also agree, a real issue. We are absolutely um, struggling um, continually with waiting lists for uh, elementary school, after school, um, and hearing from principals who don't hear, hear from after school, a phenomenon that we are aware of is principals who are desperate for after school because parents go elsewhere uh, to programs where there are after school programs. Um, so there, these challenges are real, um, but the, um, the need is real, and as a sector, uh, we would absolutely work with um, the city to um, expand after school. Yeah, at CPC, we actually have 11 sites over three boroughs. Six of those are compass sites, and five of those are actually fee for a really small nominal fee for service sites. Um, and that was due to the district borough office telling us that, you know, they wanted more service for their children, principals reaching out to us because there was not that same service after school quality care. And so at CPC, we've taken on those costs of it, a uh, bulk of the cost of it, um, just to make sure that we serve all children. Uh, so we wanna ensure that those, even the nominal fee programs, that we have quality that's sustainable across the board and not just, let's just because we're a compass program, we provide more, but we wanna see that we wanna be where agencies, CBOs can also take on that cost of servicing. So that indirect fee is really important to us in terms of that, to have that capacity building as well. And as well as also the staff retention, also the background checks and those talks in between regulatory um, uh, agencies that needs to be there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. And our next panel. Okay, next panel, Gregory Brinder, United Neighborhood Houses. Robert Cardero, Grand Street Settlement. Marie Choi, YMCA of Greater New York. 
Annie Minguez, Good Shepherd Services, Faith BM, UJA Federation of New York, and Abidam Bello, CPRC. Yes, as All right. soon as you, um, you, you're settled, identify yourself in your uh, organization and have at it. Hi, I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Kalos, for um, all your leadership on this issue and the opportunity to testify. Uh, United Neighborhood Houses is a policy and Could you change. pull your mic a little closer, Gregory? Sure. Thank uh, you. Better? Cool. Uh, United Neighborhood Houses is a policy and social change organization comprising 43 settlement houses um, in New York City and upstate. Uh, we are longtime proponents of universal access to after school and are part of Campaign for Children, which has been working for years uh, to ensure access to high quality, stable systems of early childhood education and after school for every child in New York City. And we really appreciated the opportunity to work with the City Council and with, the D and with DYCD uh, to expand access to after school. Um, we do support moving to universal and really recognize the need. We hear every day from providers who have wait lists, from schools who are reaching out to their CBO partners saying, we want you to come to another school, we want you to expand in our school, and so we see the need, but we do believe that there's a need for uh, certain steps to make sure that we actually have the infrastructure in place to ensure that providers can offer high quality programs. Uh, the first and most important step, and it's one that's really addressing a crisis, is to design a system to quickly process background checks for the staff coming into after school programs. Um, after school providers and advocates, we jointly support stringent checks to make sure that everyone who has access to children, be they a staff member or a volunteer, um, is checked in the most comprehensive way possible. And we depend on our partners in government to have systems in place to make sure that that can happen. Um, we need that system to be working in place to clear the backlog of staff members who are waiting to work in after school programs, who are waiting to serve children, sometimes doing administrative work, sometimes just starting to wait their job to start their jobs, uh, so that these programs can get going and can start providing the needed and quality services um, that they are actually being paid by the city to do. Um, we also uh, want to ensure that the rates are both adequate and equitable. Uh, we appreciate you uh, bringing up the difference between the programs funded at 3200 and 2800 in the COMPASS programs, and we appreciate hearing that there's going to be the beginning of a process that seems like it will go on until past the end of this administration uh, for re-procuring um, the RFPs. Um, we really hope that DYCD, MOX, other parts of the administration work closely with providers both to determine uh, what are the needs of the communities because providers who are working every day in the communities know what they are and what are the rates that are actually going to uh, cover those costs. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, the rates cover uh, disparate funding levels and increases that happen in minimum wage and other increases um, including uh, thresholds for overtime exemptions. Um, we hope that this can be a collaborative process um, and that the input of providers, the input of community members is taken in place. And thank you again. It sounds like my time is up. Um, but again, we appreciate all of uh, your leadership and the opportunity to work with the council on these um, important issues. Hi. Thank you so much for allowing us to testify on the oversight hearing and also for your leadership, uh, Council Member Rose and also Council Member Kios. Thank you so much for um, not only introducing these bills in conjunction with the chair, but also for inviting providers to join you in conversation about uh, these bills. I will submit my full testimony for the record. Um, I want to just 
reiterate that a lot of the uh, comments made by Gregory Brender of UNH are those of Good Shepherd. You know, Good Shepherd opened its first after school program in Red Hook. Did in you state your name? Oh, <laughs> Annie Elisa Minguez Garcia, um, the Director of Government and Community Relations for Good Shepherd Services. And Good Shepherd Services opened its first after school program in Red Hook in 1991. And since then, uh, we've been expanding programs throughout the Bronx and Brooklyn. We currently serve 3,000 children um, annually. Uh, and we, we focus, you know, like one of the things that you've heard today is on our approaches and our uh, encouraging encouragement of young people. And that's really important at the core of everything that we do. So we're excited that um, these bills have been introduced and that the council is talking about elementary universal after school. It is something that as a member of the steering committee of the Campaign for Children, we fully support. And we wanna ensure that there's a partnership with us as these conversations continue. And so I was glad to hear you, Chair, say that you would like to be in conversations with DYCD as they look at this. Um, in my testimony I outlines a lot of things, but I just wanna make sure to say um, that, again, the sector has been forced to advocate on an annual basis for the inclusion of funding to support Sonic summer programming in the adopted budget. Any bill referencing universal access needs to include a summer component and a commitment from the administration to work with providers to support the workforce needs, including the clearances that we've been talking about today. It's also critical that the council continue to partner with the administration to develop an implementation plan that includes lessons learned from the sonic expansion and that any new slots are adequately funded. On high school, after school, I just wanna say Good Shepherd runs four after school programs for high school students. We look forward to working with the council to develop a strategy for real investment investments to increase programming to high school students. There's a need and we are ready to fill that need. Um, I'll leave that then. Thank you so much. Willing to answer any questions. Thank you, Gregory. Robert Cordero, Executive Director of Grand Street Settlement. Thank you, Chair Rose and the committee. Wanted to give a special shout out to Council Member Chin. We're in her home district. And, and um, for Chair Kalos for his leadership on this, uh, uh, on this potential legislation. Uh, Grand Street Settlement was established in 1916. We've been providing youth services for over 103 years. So we have something to say on this topic. Grand Street supports, fully supports efforts to implement universal after school in New York City. Uh, as one of the leading providers of after school programs in New York, we know that quality after school programs are one of the best ways to support working families and that these programs can equip students and their families to step out of poverty and into opportunity. Grand Street currently serves over 4,500 students and their families in our after school programs at 26 sites across Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. This includes eight Sonic programs, two Compass programs, and nine DYCD funded Cornerstone Community Centers. We've provided over 3,000 hours of out of school after school learning to these young people in the last year. Our after school programs are designed to support the goal of closing the opportunity and achievement gaps between, ch between children in our communities that we serve and their more affluent peers. Our model has been developed and refined through decades of experience and is founded in evidence-based and evidence-informed practices. Grand Street offers our young people a safe, healthy, and nurturing environment through which they can explore a wide variety of experiences not otherwise available to them, including science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. 77% of our after-school participants reported that our after-school program made them more interested and engaged in STEM and STEAM topics. As the City Council debates universal after-school, here are our recommendations. We fully support the United Neighbor Houses and Campaign for Children's priorities. And in addition, we want to expand as a community-based provider to give a little bit more perspective. If we do this, fully fund the programs. 
We have to fundraise to cover the subsidy and the gap when these programs are, are covered on a government contract in order to fully support the costs. Don't build the system on the backs of community, community service providers who struggle with unfunded mandates and late payments and delays due to bureaucratic snafus like clearances. Focus on the areas of highest need. Happy to hear DYCD say that earlier, their leadership. Schools and districts in New York City are not equal. Look holistically at the community resources that are already in place, like PTAs, or lacking, and build resources in the communities where they're most needed, like in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Final two, coordinate these resources, federal, city, state, and private, and please allow flexibility at the community level. After school programs can have their biggest impact if they're given the flexibility to meet basic needs and build programs from there. Thank you for this opportunity. Good morning. Uh, my name is Abi Odumbello. I'm the executive director of Croton Running Club. But I'm here today to support the, in favor of the after school program. Uh, my son is a, is a senior attending RIC and I have two daughters who graduated from New York City Public School. As a parent who was intimately involved in New York City Public Education System for 20, 20 years, I understand the value of parental involvement in educating their children. I was a focal participant in my children's education, becoming the president of the Community Education Council in District 32 for six years. And also, I was a treasurer on City Council of High School uh, in 2010 to 2011. I'm in favor of the universal after school program, which mandate for an after school program slot for any student who requested one. This is a good news. There is no doubt that after school program, if properly planned and administered, will be vital in helping our children to succeed in reaching their goals. The first step in ensuring the success of this program must be adequate research to identify practical solutions that will best serve our diverse communities. Specifically, focus group of the most successful members of the respective target community must be con conducted to where the solution can inspire and transform the life of our children. We need those solutions that will best help to level the playing field for our children. Additionally, we must recognize there is no one side fit all approach that can work for the diverse communities. Therefore, program designed for black and brown community must be structured to effectively to effective positive results in those communities. Programs that include further education are essential for high school students, including me uh, mechanical, electrical, and other skills that the student can market, can market directly to the public. These skills will undoubtedly build confidence. Other resources, training, and skills with considerable real life value include book clubs, writing courses, debate team, and homework help. We must help our children to grow with our evolving economy with requisite training and skill. We must prepare them to at least have the option to become entrepreneur. We have to design a program so that the kids also in future have something to look at in future. In short, our children need a source of inspirations and motivations and to help ensure that they do not submit to hopelessness. Finally, any investment we make in our children is an investment in our respective community that help to reboot our middle class. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Marie Choi. I'm the Director of Middle School and Community Programming for the YMCA of Greater New York. Thank you, Chair Rose and the Youth Services Committee members for the opportunity to testify on DY City's Compass and Sonic programs, the reporting bill of existing after-school programs, and the Universal After-School Bill. I want to thank the Council for being zealous advocates for youth services by securing 4,000 new Compass slots in last year's adopted budget. We need this zealous advocacy advocacy to continue, as we call the administration, to issue a new Compass and Sonic RFP. Uh, the Compass program is currently a two-tier two -tier per participant rate system, one cohort of nearly 200 programs contracted at a rate of $2,800, and the other cohort of approximately 125 sites contracted at a rate of $3,200. The Compass sites at the lower rate are not required to have an education specialist, whereas the other one uh, are required to have one for at least nine hours a week. And we know that education specialists are essential for quality after-school programs. They align after-school lesson plans to school day learning and are often certified educators. These two tiers need to align to receive substantially more in funding to provide the high quality services that our city's children deserve. Consider the fact that the $3,200 cohort contracted, contracts were executed in 2012 where the average salary for a site director was $45,000 and frontline staff earned about $11.50 per hour. Um, the SONIC program is also comprised of two tiers of services offered, one cohort of approximately 80 middle school programs that have dedicated summer camp slots and the other of 400 middle school programs without dedicated summer camp slots. Thank you to the council, a large number of these SONIC summer program slots have been restored year to year. However, this year to year funding is not best practice as providers cannot properly promote and plan summer camp programs when funding is announced in June. You know, a barrier to assessing after school and summer camp is the availability of these services. When possible, the Y works with PTAs to operate fee-based Y after school, such as PS228 in Jackson Heights, and in other instances, we manage to operate Y after school, after school programs with funding from the council's after school enrichment initiative, such as PS33 in Chelsea. This remedy is only a band-aid, and it is not sustainable as operation costs increase. A more sound and sustainable solution would be to expand Compass and Sonic site lists. Another pressing issue that the sector is facing is the new OCFS clearance process for all SAC licensed programs. Effective September 25th, 2019, all new staff are required to complete additional federal background checks prior to beginning employment in our after school programs. Just to wrap it up, <laughs> this process has completely slowed down our hiring of staff. In the 70Y after school programs, we have submitted over 250 staff for clearance and we have received only 30. This has severely impacted the scope of our services across New York City. We currently have over 500 children citywide on a city on a wait list as a result of this backlog. Thank you um, for letting us testify. And just like my colleagues here, we also, the YMC also supports the spirit of both pieces of legislation. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Rose, Council Member Kalos. My name is Faith Bayham. I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. Established more than 100 years ago, UJA is one of the nation's largest local philanthropies. UJA supports a network of nearly 100 nonprofit organizations serving those that are most vulnerable and in need of programs and services. Our network of nonprofit partners oversee Compass and Sonic school year and summer programs throughout the five boroughs. As a member of the steering committee of the Campaign for Children, UJA has advocated to increase access to high quality after school and summer programs for children and youth across the city. Recognizing the need for universal after school and summer programs, we also acknowledge expansion of these programs must be done in a way that assists providers and rectifies current issues with the system. So a lot of the issues I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna be echoing my, quote, my colleagues here. Um, but first and foremost, rates um, for Compass and Sonic programs. Uh, providers received to manage their programs must be improved before universal after school programs are initiated. Current rates included in Compass and Sonic contracts makes it, it make it extremely difficult for providers to offer high quality programs to participants. 
Um, second, rate discrepancies must be addressed in COMPAS programs to adequately support the providers of these services before making the program universal. A number of our providers are continuing to see, receive $2,800 per child, which is $400 less than their $3,200 base rate. Um, also, implementation of indirect rates and cost of living adjustment varies by COMPAS and SONIC programs. Some programs have received funding for COLAs in their contracts, while others continue to wait for this funding. Third, talking to the staffing issue, acquiring enough employees to staff a universal after-school program would also be challenging for providers. This has recently been exasperated by the new comprehensive background check requirements instituted by the New York State Office of Children and Families and overseen by DOH, MH, and New York. Um, just in summary of that, uh, providers support rigorous background checks for all staff, but the inability to hire in a timely manner has put a huge strain on the entire after-school program system. Any consideration of transitioning to a universal after-school system must include improving the comprehensive background check system. Um, lastly, um, Intro 1100 would make after-school programs available for every student, um, but we'd also like to see a summer programming component to that. Um, summer programming is a cru crucial piece of out-of-school out supports that should be included in this legislation. Um, thank you so much for your support, and we look forward to advocating with you um, in this upcoming budget negotiation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize that Councilmember Perkins has joined us. Thank you. Uh, is it, if, if you have not already submitted your testimony in writing, if we can get that today, if possible. Uh, I just wanted to uh, beg forgiveness. Uh, I have a hearing next door on the local procurement of food with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, so I will have to excuse myself after this uh, panel. I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, for testifying, I, I guess the uh, the question that uh, we we have coming from DYCD is in terms of capacity for growth, and uh, I understand the universe of other issues that impact it based on what the other panel shared. But if you can share what your current capacity is, and assuming we fixed everything in a perfect universe, we're actually paying what we're supposed to for every single seat. Uh, what kind of capacity would you have for growth, and what would you prioritize? If anyone wants to answer that. Um, I, I, I can take that. Um, so I think that similar to DYCD, all providers need to kind of go back, look at the number of schools in their district, think about um, staffing is a big issue here. So if we're not able to fix kind of like this issue that we're having now, we might not be able to ramp up. Um, for an expansion. So I think that um, they almost go hand in hand. We have to kind of fix the concert, the concerns around clearances that we have right now. But if you're, I think we all would probably give you the same answer, that the answer is yes, we would be willing to uh, expand and to provide more services in our community. For some of us, we have wait lists and programs. Um, I know that we've in the past been able to track those and it would be interesting if the council would like to engage providers around that conversation about what do wait lists look like and as you're looking at the conversation with DOE around what schools don't have services, if there could be like a matching, um, I just think that you know the, the partnership is gonna be crucial as we have the, these conversations. So, so I, I will bite if you could all share what your wait lists currently look like. I don't have my numbers with me but by sight, but I have requested them from our program director, so I'll be sure to get back to you on that. Thank you, anybody else, your wait list? It's actually, uh, Robert uh, Cordero from Grand Street Settlement. It's actually hard to determine wait list because it's different from potential demand. There could be uh, demand where, par where parents want the service, are not aware um, of it. As the borough president mentioned earlier, may not even be aware what is available or, or Council Member Rosenthal. Um, so you could have uh, a wait list. Where we see the most wait lists, honestly, is the summer camp programs. And I know that we're not talking about that now, but I think that's always the last, that, what was described earlier, where there's not enough slots to fill the demand for 
summer camp programming. After schools, I think it is more difficult because you could have a wait list, but that might just be a fraction of what the demand would be. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure all of us can get back to you or UNH and others on what the, the actual wait list look like, but I wouldn't, I would just start that as a watermark for what the, the true demand is, is like, especially given the fact that only half the schools in the city have actual after school programming that's funded by the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting that you made um, a distinction between the wait list and demand. Uh, I, I, and I like that because I, I understand the difficulty in establishing the wait list um, and that the demand would still, could still far exceed um, what the wait list looked like. Um, so how would we capture what sort of like what the demand is. I, I think that's because that's sort of what's at the crux of this whole, you know, hearing is trying to show that the demand, we know it far out seeds what, you know, what we're getting, the services we're getting now, but trying to sort of assess what that, that demand actually is um, at, at least that's the conversation we're getting from the administration. Um, so do you have any ideas um, about how we might be able to capture what the demand is? <laughs> it's a, I know so it's a conundrum, I, right? I think that probably the best way to go about it is looking not so much as sort of how many people applied to programs, but to take um, sort of an assumption based on a percentage of the number of uh, children in the public school system. Um, I'm not, we've been trying to figure out what that take up rate would be mm -hmm. um, because we know once you sort of make it known that there's a program um, available, and we saw this happen with, with pre-kindergarten, um, the take up rates increase. So I think it comes not so much on a, it's not a kind of number based on um, like we'd have an X number who applied to Grand Street and Y at another um, organization, but that you know some percentage of uh, of children would participate, and we suspect in elementary school it would be higher than the rates of participation in Sonic, just because um, to some extent elementary school students have uh, fewer options um, in that they're more limited in their mobility. Okay. Chair Rose, I would say, look, no one's talking about compulsory after-school programs necessarily, but a way to just opt out. I think so much of the problem, if we fixed all the other parts of the system, but the way for parents who don't speak English, who might not have a high school or an elementary school education navigate the system, and we run universal pre-K programs also, it's, is maddening. I think just an auto enrollment streamlined system in the areas of highest need with the lowest income students is a really great place to start and look and then the rate of those children enrolling would be would be much higher and it would be almost be an opt-out because the fact of the matter is their parents are working or they're going to school mm -hmm. or they're doing gigs and they need that extra right. time beyond 2 30 3 o'clock 3 15 to, to get to five or six o'clock when they're home or later. And so, you know, I think this kind of biting around the edges, if you're gonna go universal, go big, you know, where every child has the opportunity, is already enrolled in, and the assumption is that it is needed, they can disenroll or they can pay for a fee base if their parents can do it or they can opt out of the system. But I think how this system gets built mm -hmm. and how children enroll into it seamlessly will also be less burdensome, honestly, for the city, for DOE, and for community-based providers like Grand Street and the others that are testifying today. And that makes a big, it makes for a big dollar figure when we talk budget. Yes, sir. Well, I was just assuming, if you say it's gonna be universal, I know it might sound, you know, a lot of money, can we assume that all the kids will take advantage of it if you build it? If you build, if you have the system in place, they will come. They will come. Uh, I, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
I, I want to thank you all for your testimony today. Um, and uh, because we have so many people and time, um, we have a number of questions that we really would like to have answered. Um, I'd like to send them to all of our, um, everyone who testifies. And if you would take a little time to just give it back to us. Um, we can't enter it in the record, but your testimonies um, will be in the record. But we need it um, to try to collect some of the data that uh, we'd like to use um, in our argument with the administration, okay? And that's for all of the, the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, the next, yes. Okay, um, the, if you're uh, looking for the contracts committee, that's next door. Um, I wouldn't want you to be in the wrong place. Uh, and um, we're gonna lose council member Kalos shortly to the contracts committee. Yes. Okay, next panel, uh, Dr. Sat Patatria, uh, Daryl Hornick uh, Becker. Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Uh, Dr. Sat was with Harlem Children's Society. Uh, Janelle Canals, Advocates for Children of New York. Nancy D. Miller, uh, Visions Services for the Blind. Marcel Braithwaite, the Police Athletic League. And Mani Paul, Global Kids Inc. And while they're um, assembling uh, we have, for the record, a testimony um, from Stanley M. Isaacs Neighborhood Center, Rhonda Braxton, who is the Deputy Director of Youth Services Committee on Youth Services. Um, and this is from the Stanley M. Isaacs Neighborhood Center, and it will be entered into the record. Um, and as soon as you're assembled, you may um, state your name and your organization and you can begin. Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Chairman Rose, uh, council members, um, council member Ben Callos. Um, it's an honor to be speaking here on behalf of an organization that I founded 20 years ago. Uh, I founded this organization called Harlem Children's Society to address the needs of under-resourced, underserved, folks in STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and math. Back then, 20 years ago, there was a serious dearth of folks in such careers. I'm from Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I'm a director of, um, of uh, cancer research at various facilities at Sloan Kettering. I also live in the neighborhood where I started the organization. The organization Harlem Junior Society, even though it is Harlem Children's Society. People think it is just in Harlem, but we serve over the years all over the city in all boroughs. So it started with three students in my lab doing hands-on research in science and technology. And over the period of 20 years, we have evolved over um, 800 students and 5,000 students have gone through the program in all these years. We've been following these students from high school because I strongly believe that the students have to be engaged at very young levels and groomed over a period of time in very intense research. So it is very extremely hard work. We take, we take the uncut diamonds from the various poorest districts. All the students who qualify in the program are below poverty line, Title I schools, uh, and and because they're below poverty line, over the period we have seen consistently that 30, 35% are African American, an equal number of Hispanic students, and then immigrants of all sorts. So, uh, so that has been consistent over the period of time. Um, and as it has grown, we have been following the students in undergraduate years. So those students who have come from the high school and we've also gone experimenting with middle school, um, and we've been following through, um, through undergraduate and some through graduate schools. So we have had a history of students who have gone through our programs for all these years, coming in, doing intense research, everything from space research to environmental research to, uh, to all sorts of cancer research, neuroendocrine research, and so forth. 
And as we've been following our students, many of my former students are already professors at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, some with double MDs and PhDs, but they started when they were 14, 15, 16 years old. So this is what we have seen is students may come from extremely challenged backgrounds. And we pair with students from Bronx and Brooklyn and Manhattan, the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, wherever they are. And because of the unique school system that has evolved in our country for several decades now, that families go to their school districts and, and they remain there till they hit college and university, and that's where that it's a bigger challenge for them uh, that students coming from outside the country fare better than students within the country or within the city. And so there's a high dropout rate for African Americans and Hispanic students all over the country. As many as 40% of all African American Hispanic students drop out in the first few semesters, first two semesters in the country in all universities and colleges. Why? Because they are not trained, the school systems usually don't train these students for college level tasks. So we've been following them, we need an assistance from the city, and I think because it's a hands-on program, it is a skills-based program, it's an employment program, I feel strongly that the city and the DYCD should, should perhaps help us to facilitate this process. Thanks. Thank you so much, thank Thanks. you. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss how New York City can create a plan for universal after-school programming. My name is Janelle Canals, and I'm a senior staff attorney with Advocates for Children. Can you pull your mic a little oh, closer sorry. to you? Yes. Um, my name is Janelle Canals. I am a senior staff attorney with Advocates for Children. For more than 45 years, Advocates for Children has worked to ensure high-quality education for New York City students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low-income backgrounds. Through our work with families, we see the need for universal after-school programming, and especially for families with limited financial means. After-school programs help improve children's development, safety, and academic performance. Such programs allow children and youth to engage in academic and developmental enrichment activities in a safe environment. We therefore support intros 1100 and 1113. As the City Council advances these bills, we would like to make a few recommendations to help ensure that universal after-school programming is accessible to all students, including students with disabilities, students in temporary housing, and students in foster care. Although after-school programs must serve students with disabilities and provide reasonable accommodations for students to participate, we've heard from families that programs are not always able to meet the needs of these children. For example, one parent contacted Advocates for Children after her child's after-school program requested that she pick her child up every day from the program early due to his behaviors related to his disability. A plan to create universal after-school programming must ensure that all students can benefit from such programming, including students with disabilities. We recommend adding a provision to intro 1113, requiring that the Department of Education and DYCD report the steps that both agencies have taken to better support after-school programs in meeting the needs of students with disabilities. Another barrier that we see with after-school programming is transportation. For students in temporary housing, foster care, and students with disabilities, the Department of Education provides door-to-door -door busing to, student, to a student's residence at the end of the school day. If a child would like to participate in an after-school program, the parent must either pick the child up or pay for alternate transportation. This policy significantly limits access to these programs for many students who rely on Department of Education transportation to get home from school. Given the significant obstacle, we also recommend adding a provision to intro 1113 requiring that the Department of Education and DYCD report on their efforts to address transportation barriers, including efforts to expand door-to-door -door busing to help students who qualify for day -to school day busing access after-school programs. Our written testimony also includes additional recommendations. We thank the council for its leadership on these bills and look forward to working with the city council to move them forward. Thank you.
Thank you. My name is Nancy D. Miller. I'm the executive director and CEO of Vision Services for the Blind. Everything you said, I agree with. Um, I, I would just like to add, uh, Visions has run an after-school program for blind high school students um, for uh, close to two decades now. Previously, it was funded through DYCD OST. When OST was eliminated for high school students, we lost that contract. We do get some state funding in order to continue the after-school program. It is free of charge. Any legally blind student is welcome to attend. It's five days a week up until seven o'clock at night. So it meets some of the unmet needs of blind high school students. I heard DYCD talk about how students with disabilities are integrated into after school programming. However, if we're going to be tracking the use of after school, we need to break out which students with which disabilities are using which after school programs. Tracking is great, but if all students are combined together, we won't get the evidence that we need whether or not students with disabilities are being served at the same level as students without disabilities. I also feel strongly that we should track by disability. We heard about a great program in Brooklyn that serves children with autism. We serve children who are blind, including children with other disabilities. And there are many other specialized programs that do exist, but are we serving people with disabilities in our after-school programs at the same level, regardless of what their disability is? We also feel that there needs to be choice there are specialized programs like Visions. There are also integrated programs, inclusion, where students have a choice of being in a school program after school. Transportation is a big issue. We teach blind high school students mobility, how to get around New York City independently. But if they're bused to the school, the school will not allow them to travel from the school to our after school program. Because if you're bused in, you must be bused out. We very much would like Department of Education to be flexible and allow a student to be cleared for independent mobility so they can attend uh, the, the after school program of their choice. We also feel there should be carve out funding the New York City Department for the Aging right now is looking at building innovation and flexibility into their RFP, and we feel DYCD should do the same. There are some programs that don't fit into the constraints of their request for a proposal, like Visions program. And so we cannot apply for the funding. The numbers we serve are fewer, but the intensity and the comprehensiveness of the service we provide, um, we believe, should allow us to apply for essentially what might be a sole source pro, uh, program funding where specialized services have the opportunity to apply outside of the COMPASS um, or other RFPs. We also feel the Department of Education must educate students with disabilities and their parents about the array of after-school programs. Yes, it's important that DYCD has this interactive internet interface, but many of the students we work with and their families do not have internet at home. So if DYCD is only using an internet portal, these students and their parents will never know that the programs exist. And DOE has an obligation to make this available to students and parents that don't have access to the internet. And we also feel that although it's required by law that students with disabilities have a transition plan in their individual 
uh, programs, many students with disabilities do not have a transition plan. After school programs deal directly with the transition from school to college or school to work. And we want to make sure that those transition plans mention after school programming and that the after school programming is available for those students who need it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilmember Rose. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Marcel Braithwaite. I'm the Director of Community Engagement with the Police Athletic League. The Police Athletic League supports and inspires New York City youth in partnership with the NYPD and the law enforcement community. And we thank you for your partnership specifically in Staten Island and have had a wonderful experience working with you. Um, the Police Athletic League supports the concept of universal after school programming. We recommend the development of a detailed program implementation blueprint to accompany the bill. Any plan to support this bill must include an assessment of the current system, provisions for vulnerable youth, and adequate levels of financial support for host agencies. A successful expansion is only possible if adequate levels of financial support to host agencies is a part of the plan. To implement a quality program, we should calculate the cost per youth to include the additional costs agencies incur to market, administer, supervise the program. In addition, the council must provide funding so that the salary or stipend parameters can be set at a competitive rate. And we also implore the council to be mindful that school-based as well as community centers are a valuable part of the after school infrastructure and system. And we encourage you to think of that as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and the rest is included in our written testimony. Thank you. Um, did you identify yourself? I did, but I could do it again. Okay. My name is Marcel Braithwaite. I'm okay. the director of I'm community sorry. engagement for the Police Athletic League. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Hornick Becker, and I'm a policy and advocacy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. CCC is a 75 year old independent multi issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. CCC is also a lead organization of the Campaign for Children, and so my statement today will echo many of their concerns. I'd like to thank you, Chair Rose, and all the members of the Committee on Youth Services for holding today's hearing on after-school programming. High-quality, year-round after-school programs allow children and youth to engage in academic and developmental enrichment activities in a safe environment. Further, they allow parents to work and support their families, thus preventing economic insecurity. After-school programs are a win for children, families, communities, and taxpayers. CCC applauds the City Council for its long-standing commitment to preserving and expanding access to these after-school benefits. Today, I would like to speak about building on these wins, specifically as it relates to Introduction 1100, or the Universal After-School Program Plan. While we greatly support any effort to expand after-school access towards achieving universality, we have some concerns with the legislation as it currently stands. Firstly, calls for universal after-school fall short if they don't include a summer component. New York's kids need universal year-round access to programming, but instead the current system leaves children and their families behind, either waiting until the last minute to find out if they have a summer slot or not funding them at all. Every year since 2014, 34,000 summer Sonic slots for middle school students have been cut by the administration, and every year we must fight to restore them. We fully expect the same budget dance to happen again this year, leaving parents waiting until the last minute to find out if they have programming over the summer. Additionally, this puts immense strain on the after-school providers who must develop budgets, staff up, and enroll their programs all at the last minute. A real immediate commitment to expanding after-school access would mean finally baselining the full 34,000 middle school summer slots and including them in earlier versions of the budget. Secondly, a universal after-school plan must raise current rates for elementary school slots. There are still many compass after-school slots for elementary school students that were funded by the previous administration at a base rate of 2,800 per student. $400 less than the current 3200 base rate. Universal after-school legislation should first eliminate these per-child rate disparities so that as the system expands, it doesn't leave some programs behind. Lastly, slots need to be first added where they are needed the most. This is elementary school, where there are approximately 500,000 students, where there are only 47,000 after-school slots. Prioritizing elementary school access would ensure that all slots are filled and that with added funding, there's not an oversaturation of slots and competition between programs. 
CCC is excited by the council's interest in achieving universal after school, and we believe that by addressing our concerns and those of the advocates here today, we can achieve a truly universal year-round after school system that benefits all New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hello, thank you for hosting this hearing. My name is Jadna Ramirez. I am the director of high school programs at Global Kids. I am also the mom of a nine-year-old girl uh, who's in fourth grade. Um, Global Kids educates, activates, and inspires young people from underserved communities in all five boroughs to take actions on critical issues facing their communities and the world at large. Global Kids taps into young people's um, interest and leadership potential, fostering an inquiry-based environment that encourages critical thinking, academic achievement, and global competency, and we have been doing this work for 30 years. Um, like I said before, I am here as an educator, but also as the parent of a fourth grade student in the Bronx, um, to say that universal high quality after school program needs to be a priority. In my professional career in youth development, I have seen the power and impact that high quality after school program has on students. I want my child and every New York City student to be able to have access to those programs free of cost. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being an advocate and a supporter of after school programs, Chair Rose. Um, I wanted to say, I am Anne-Marie Paul, and I am also with Global Kids. I'm the director of middle school programs. And I wanted to say, what makes Global Kids special is that our students take action to improve the world around them. We have an annual youth conference that is planned and led by our students. They educate their peers on matters of climate change, racial and gender equity, and criminal justice reform. Students have participated in the March for Our Lives, Black Lives Matter Action Weeks, and recently the Youth Climate March. Our students give back to their communities by volunteering their time and donating goods. At Global Kids, we believe that strong relationships are the backbone of strong programs. And to that end, we employ two to four full-time youth development professionals at all of our full site, uh, at all of our after-school sites. We find that this makes it seamless, our partnership with schools, and most importantly, we develop incredible relationships with students in the process. We greet them in the morning. Our doors are open throughout the day. We work with teachers to conduct push-in activities. We accompany schools on school trips, and we conduct lunchtime activities. As a result, all of our programs are over-enrolled, but it's costly to provide all-day services to our schools. In our high school programs, it means that staff are there two days a week versus five days. And in our Sonic programs, it means that we have a reduced number of activity, specials, activity specialists, and it makes it impossible to have a dedicated educational specialist who doesn't also occupy other roles within the organization. And furthermore, as we know, we have young professionals who have made the decision to give back to their communities, often struggling to make ends meet. And I don't think that that is an adequate reward for making those sacrifices. Um, and lastly, I want to say thank you once again um, to Chair Rose and also Council Member um, Helen Rosenthal for so saliently describing the issue with summer camp funding, right, and why that's problematic. And we recommend, of course, that um, summer camp funding is included in the preliminary budget process. We know that the status quo is unjust to children and families and also to providers. And so I just want everyone present to imagine the depth of learning experiences, trips, um, partnerships that we could plan for and create if we were given the appropriate opportunity to plan for our students, and our students deserve that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all um, uh, and let you know that all of your comments are so salient and that we are um, not only recording it, but that we are going to take them into consideration, you know, when we are negotiating the budget. Um, and again, we have one more panel. One more, one more panel. So um, I have some questions that I know you have the answers to. Um, so we, we will be sending them to you. And if you'll be as kind to, to answer them for us. Um, so that we can have the data that we need to fight this fight. 
So thank you all so much for being so patient and being here today. And our next panel is <laughs> Susan Matloff Nieves, Goddard Riverside Community Center. Jazeel Montez, International Creations Inc. Judith Klein, representing herself. Alton um, Mabel, Tropagate Inc. Um, Antoine Capelan, Sheltering Arms. Dr. Vanessa Cicado, uh, Pediatrician Union Community Health Center. Thank you all. Um, when you get seated, please identify yourself in your organization and you can begin. And thank you for your patience. Ah, thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Matloff Nevis. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Youth and Aging at Goddard Riverside Community Center. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Rose. We just so treasure your advocacy and your passion. Um, Goddard Riverside is a settlement house. We're a multi-service neighborhood center, um, actually serving all of Manhattan, but focusing on the Upper West Side and Morningside Heights in Harlem. We are, I, I guess I would just say in, in brief summary, if you fund it, we'll fill it. We have no funding for our elementary school children um, because of the demographics of the Upper West Side, which is extraordinarily wealthy, but we still have pockets of poverty, NYCHA buildings, low-income Mitchell Lama, rent-stabilized tenants. Most of our schools did not qualify for Compass funding. We have two, we are currently and have for many decades run after-school programming in two NYCHA developments, Amsterdam Houses and, Bernie, and um, the Wise Towers. They were not eligible for Cornerstone because only, only directly operated centers by NYCHA became Cornerstones. So we met with the commissioner. He explicitly said to us four times, no, 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 stop asking me. If that requirement was changed, we could provide free after school. Currently, half of our families make less than 25000 a year. We are forced to charge them a fee. Our board raises hundreds of thousands of dollars that they target almost entirely to our youth programs. It's unsustainable for our agency to keep with rising costs, and it's unsustainable for our families. Um, it's, um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. We, would, we absolutely could take 200 kids. That's our, our licensed capacity. We're currently serving something under 150 and we would happily partner with schools, but we would particularly love to be able to continue our NYCHA centers because they're, they're beautifully equipped centers with fantastic facilities that we've renovated and the families feel comfortable and safe there. We've served several generations. And finally, in closing, I would just say, I was a New York City latchkey kid in an elementary school. I do not want our city to be doing that to other kids. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, did you, uh, in your statement, you indicated that there you would like to be a part of the program? Absolutely. If, okay. if you release the RFP, to, if, if DYCD releases the RFP, we will start writing tomorrow. No, we, okay. we absolutely have the capacity, and I'll be happy to answer any of your follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hi. How, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chair Rose, for leading uh, this important effort and for allowing the opportunity to testify today before everybody here and you, the panel. Um, my name is Hassel Montes. I'm the founder and executive director of an arts nonprofit named Internal Creations, whose mission is to develop leadership, self-sufficiency, and learn life skills through learning music, specifically the classical guitar. A style of music, a style of music making that's unbeknownst to a large number of students and the general public. Internal Creations has been around for six years, and we are a small organization, a small organization with a large impact. I am here before you to advocate in favor of a fully funded quality universal after school programming. I too was once a New York City public school student and I can attest that after school programming was the catalyst to create the man I am today and the career I have the privilege of being a part of. After school programming not only keeps our children safe and productive from the hours of 2 to 6 p.m. and the weekends until parents are home, it is also an opportunity for our youth to experience the opportunity of learning different content and other crafts that are not usually offered during the school day due to uh, the school's own restrictions, whether it's time or funding. As Manhattan Borough President stated in her testimony earlier, we are unfortunately one of those organizations that are forced to only provide programming two days a week due to funding issues and are excited to work together in order to push this bill. 
The universal after-school program can provide consistency, which is a key component in education and for the development of a skill or a person. This bill can also help students dis discover possible passions and inspirations that they would not have uncovered if they did not experience these after-school programs, in our case, music. Many times, if a student is not feeling like they are achieving greatness during the school day, they learn that they thrive during our after-school guitar ensemble by seeing the tangible results, thus resulting in the positive change in their school attendance, academic approach, and understanding of life's challenges and how to overcome them. This opens the door to more than just being a great student with a well-rounded education. It also creates conscious kids that makes for better people. Uh, issues that we have encountered that um, I want to bring forth is uh, it mostly has to do with schools because of the lack of funding and also the communication within the DOE schools and CBOs and um, you know the providers. Schools don't really communicate from my experience being a small organization whether or not they will have funding for the next year to be able to continue the programming that the kids so want thus leaving us uh, kind of in the air and students wondering whether or not they will continue to have this program that they love. And if the program doesn't return the next year, they are highly disappointed and often you know, left out in the air too with no opportunities. And also for us as an organization, it does cause us to have a large staff turnover because staff expect to be year after year and the retention uh, becomes low. Um, some of the things that we, uh, we, we would like to bring up too is um, oh, an idea may seem radical, but uh, I remember this question was posed earlier, is uh, having cr uh, principals create a mandatory after school attendance for elementary, middle school, and for high school, maybe for the freshman year of high school. So that way all the students that are being funded through this, uh, through this initiative are actually present and can be a part of the programming. And if there are students who live too far or have fam, uh, or you know, if students in high school are working, uh, which they shouldn't have freshman year, uh, they can provide documentation to opt out of this. But I think with the actual mandatory thing, the funds that will be directed universally, as I remember somebody uh, from the peer, previous panel mentioned, I think it would uh, create a larger impact because sometimes we need to create those disciplined borders for students to understand what an after school program is and what it does and the, possi the possibilities that it has. I know for me it changed my life when I was forced into uh, taking an after school guitar program because I did not want to do, but then became my passion and my career now. Thank you. Thank you. And next time you testify, you have to do it musically. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the guitar next time. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Judith Middle Initial E. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Judith Middle Initial E. You can move it. Hi, my name is Judith Middle Initial E, last name Klein, K L E I N. <laughs> Lots of Judith Kleins out there. Uh, I'm, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Ms. Rose, to speak. I've um, been concerned for a long time about the problems of. Um, bullying and uh, violence and um, I'm a dance movement therapist. I've also uh, been a teacher. I went through um, uh, uh, um, uh, what <laughs> I'm, I'm losing my thought here. Anyway, uh, I have background in teaching um, and um, I don't know, do you know the name Raul Wallenberg? A lot of people don't. He's our third honorary citizen of the United States. He was 31 when he volunteered to go to Budapest, Hungary as a, as a Christian. And I, meant, I emphasize that uh, because of a reason. Swedish diplomat volunteered to go to Budapest, Hungary at the end of World War II. In six months, he saved over 100,000 Jews from the Nazis and uh, Hungarian Arrow Cross. He was arrested by the uh, Soviets, along with his chauffeur Vilmos Langfelder, thrown into the gulag. His chauffeur died in prison, but the Soviets uh, lied repeatedly about Mr. Wallenberg. He is, of course, no longer with us because 2012 was his centenary. Um, there is an organization called the Raoul Wallenberg Committee of the United States, and it has a HEROES program. Uh, if I may just read you what they say here. Um, 
A study of heroes serves as a living monument to Raoul Vonberg's humanitarian values, deeds of courage, and nonviolent heroism. And I'll give you an example afterwards of what the effect of his um, story is. Heroes is a unique academic and character education program, K through 12 plus adult, revitalizing the tradition of real heroes, role models drawn from diverse historical periods, ethnicities, and areas of accomplishment. This multicultural interdisciplinary program integrates social studies and conflict resolution, reading, writing, and language arts, character education, the arts, ethical research strategies and skills, service learning, intergenerational sharing, analysis of hero versus celebrity. Celebrities are not necessarily heroes, and heroes are not necessarily celebrities. Sometimes you have a unique individual who's both, but it's rarely so. Recognized for the exemplary way it merges character education with academics, the HEROES program has been used by over a million students in all 50 states in the United States in a broad diversity of settings, ranging from public, private, and independent schools in inner city, suburban, and rural areas, all adult prisons in the state of New Jersey and in the Midwestern Federal Penitentiary the Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, grades pre-K to 12, the Harlem Day Charter School, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington, gifted special education, ESL classes, libraries and teacher centers, and in five foreign countries, including at the Raoul Wallenberg School in Sweden and the International School in Paris. Study of Heroes has been professionally evaluated in different settings with uniformly positive outcomes. Through the example of Raoul Wallenberg and other multicultural heroes featured in a study of heroes, students of all ages learn and develop tolerance, respect, and responsibility, critical thinking skills, academic skills and artistic expression, creativity and invention, the difference between the concepts of hero and celebrity, strategies to counter violence, xenophobia, intolerance, and bullying, positive responses to negative peer pressure, intergenerational sharing, family and community involvement, leadership and citizenship. So I think this would be ideal, starting with an after school program, eventually going through the regular school program. Uh, I wanna give you two examples of what this program okay, does. Okay, you have to wrap up. Oh, okay, okay, so then I'll skip those. I just wanted, I have two others. <laughs> All right, the other thing, I'm a dance movement therapist. One of my colleagues, Rena Kornblum, developed a program called the Disarming the Playground, Violence Prevention Through Movement and Pro-Social Skills. She developed it because her children were in elementary schools. There was a lot of bullying and other problems, uh, adults uh, accosting children. And so she developed this program of movement and the, the, uh, the dramatic drop in bullying and the children are able to get the help that they needed and I have this thing. And the last one, um, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, you may know of it. They have a tolerance magazine, they have programs. So those are the three. I would strongly suggest that you have these programs in your after school programs and along with the, all, all the others because I think they're very uh, important. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in the times that we happen to be in now, um, those programs are, are very much needed. Thank you for bringing that to the, to the city council today. And I will give you this. Good afternoon. My name is Antonio Capillang. I'm with Sheltering Arms. I'm the assistant director of after school programs. And thank you, Chair Rose and the committee for allowing us to testify uh, before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the city's largest providers of education, youth development, and community and family well-being programs for the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. We serve 15,000 children, youth, and families, and 2,500 of those uh, youth are enrolled in our after-school programs. We have 10 contracts with DYCD, four Compass, uh, five middle school Sonic programs, and one uh, pilot juvenile justice program. We're grateful for the council's ongoing support for after school programming in New York City and un your understanding for the need of these services. We fully support the expansion uh, of after school programs in order to meet the demonstrated demand for these services. However, there's some systematic 
challenges that threaten to undermine the quality uh, of the system if they're not addressed. We've heard it at length before, background checks. Um, just to give an anecdote on it, uh, we've submitted at least 30 uh, staff to get cleared by uh, OCFS uh, since September. Um, that's not to say that we don't have staff who've applied and dropped out of the process because of the, pr because of the length of the clearances. So that's not saying those numbers. Um, with those 30, we haven't received not one clearance. Other agencies have. I believe another agency said they received 30. We've sh shelled out 30, and we haven't heard w one thing at all. Um, this puts us in an impossible situation because when we try to serve after school um, students, we can't we can't continue to serve our contract goals. And more importantly, are we talking about paperwork or are we talking about safety? Uh, what's the importance? What's the point's value here? Um, in order to create safety, we need staff. In order to have staff, we go through an onboarding process. This process isn't affecting all of the agencies that are speaking here, but we are being blocked by the agency that seems to fund us and mandates us. So we definitely continue. Um, we want your support to uh, continue that effort. Um, we support the recommendation set forth by the Campaign for Children to end this hiring cr uh, crisis as we enter our summer. When we go into the summer program, we onboard almost 130 staff members throughout our 10 sites, including summer youth employment program youth who start July 1st, where the programs start. There's no time to clear them and then have them in a program. We have summer youth employment youth come on board because it helps us with our ratios to con uh, continue to maintain safety. Um, in addition to that, uh, summer programming, um, as has been said before, baselining uh, funding for SONIC programs and making uh, Compass Elementary year-round. Um, currently, our expansion for uh, Compass programs in elementary is only funded for the school year. This then goes down to the baseline um, of, of the support that we receive in after school. Um, we support the universal after school um, um, efforts that are going to be put forth. And I just want to leave you with this thought. Um, universal after school, yes, we have to create, we have to fix the problems of clearing and getting staff on board. But we are also, I haven't heard many children say, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. I want to be a political scientist when I grow up. I hear children say, I want to be a guitar instructor. I want to be a dance instructor. I want to be a, uh, a talk show host and other things like that because that's what they see. So if we give, when we move to universal after school, we are charged to help children identify their interests, explore these interests, and light the passion within that child to make that passion grow into high school, into college, and into a career. So then our children have other examples to look forth to, not just the traditional models that we see in society, which are not bad, but as we get more progressive as a society, we have to be more creative. So again, I leave you with the thought of let's invest in our children by creating safety, a universal after-school program, and let's continue to push the needle toward passion um, investment into the child's future. Thank you very much. And let the church say amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Vanessa Salcedo. I'm a pediatrician. I'm the director of uh, wellness and health promotion at Union Community Health Center, which is a federally health qualified center in the Bronx. Thank you for the opportunity for being a voice for my community health center and also for the families that I serve. Um, Union Community Health Centers in support of this legislation of universal after school programs as a pediatrician in the Bronx. I get frequently asked by my parents for advice on opportunities for safe places while they work, for programs for extra tutoring, for programs for extracurricular activities and sports for their child. Our parents are really having difficulties because of availability and financial constraints, as has been talked about all day. And on the other side, when I ask my patients what do they do after school or what have they done over winter break, the common answer is nothing. And if I do get an answer is play video games or watch YouTube. 
and we know this is not productive activities for our children. And studies show that increasing screen time decreases, decreases physical activities, also contributing to childhood obesity. We know that this constant exposure to social media is is encountering, they're getting encountered by cyberbullying, and children are getting more problems with self-esteem and space. And we know now that kids are getting higher rates of depression and anxiety and even suicide ideation by social media. Um, as I mentioned, and has been mentioned today, unsupervised teens are more vulnerable at sexual high-risk behavior which leads to STIs and teenage pregnancies, which I do see. And my patients do disclose that this is the time when they're unsupervised that these activities do happen. This was really concerning for me in my community health center. Uh, we wanted to take action. We didn't want to wait. So we created two programs, Bronx Teen Fit program that helps um, work with our physical therapy department to do exercise and proper exercise and find opportunities of physical activities in the community and also bring a wellness component um, to teach them about different activities and STDs and pregnancy prevention. We also created a program called Calm for teenage girls that help them more on mindfulness and yoga and also um, all the programs have a behavioral health component with our behavioral team. You know, these programs are great, but they're limited. You know, they're limited. We have limited capacity. We could only um, have the capacity for 10 um, students at a time. Um, I make sure that there's a strong evaluation component so they could tell us how to improve the programs. And unanimously, the kids are telling us that they want it, and they want it longer, and they need it. You know, all the evidence has shown that all these programs, extra curricular high quality programs are improving the child's self-perception, um, achievement in schools, and reducing behavioral problems. That's why it's really critical for us to really create and pass this legislative for safe, st structured environment to support the development of our youth. Thank you. Self-care is really important. They do need to learn that early. Good afternoon, my name is Danica Stewart and I'm a community tutor and development manager for Reading Partners, a literacy nonprofit that provides low-income stu struggling students with one-on-one -on -one tutoring throughout New York City. I'm sorry, Councilmember Rose, we are not in Staten Island. I know, but I'm honored to speak to you about Turn the importance. Turn her mic off right now. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but I'm honored to speak to you about the importance of after-school programming. I'd like to thank Chair Rose and the rest of the uh, committee for allowing us to create a space to talk to the public uh, on this matter. Reading Partners' mission is to help children become lifelong readers by providing individualized instruction with measurable results. In each of the 22 schools that we're currently partnered with, Reading Partners transforms a dedicated space into a reading center where we recruit and train community volunteers to tutor and serve students who are kindergarten through fourth grade who are anywhere from one month to two and a half years behind in their reading proficiency. Utilizing the expanded school day and after school programming helps us recruit tutors to our higher need, low income schools ultimately meeting the needs of students. Reading Partners has experienced the value of after-school programs firsthand. After-school programs allow additional homework support, academic support, and enrichment opportunities. According to the After School Alliance, the average cost per child for after-school programming is at least $113 per week. And 43% of parents cite that the high cost of local programs being the primary reason for not enrolling their child in after-school programming. Providing effective after-school programs for everyone can improve academic performance, reduce risky behavior, promote physical health, and provide a safe structured environment for children of working families. The benefit to the community fans far further than just students. After-school opportunities provide a chance for families to engage in the workforce while knowing their child is cared for and also allows community members to lift up their, their students. Additionally, Reading Partners will aim to provide liter literary professional development 
um, to non-literary focused partners in the after school setting. By sharing our literacy expertise and resources, we can help after school staff choose engaging read aloud books and ask guiding questions to help students practice key literary skills. This type of co collaboration can and does occur with reading partners and other nonprofit partners. We see that it's effective through the increased support that students receive across multiple disciplines after school. This allows students to succeed in school and far beyond. We ask that you support this legislation to allow students to have access to universal after school programming, which will positively affect and impact New York City families, especially in under-resourced communities that we serve. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. I wanna thank you all for your testimony. Every last one of, of, of you hit um, a mark that's really important and critical in the development of our young people. And so I wanna thank you for being so patient. I wanna thank you for being here. I wanna thank you for working and serving our young people with little resource. Uh, we hope to be able to change that. And um, we will be sending you a, a list of the questions and if you could um, send us some response so that we would have the data we need to fight. And um, thank you all, have a great day. And this meeting is adjourned. It is 2.08. Okay. <laughs>